What's up, Jimmy? Welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, man. So uh, just kind of a give, give it away. This is our, our take two on this uh, recording. I had a whole hour in yesterday, and my stupid fucking recorder decided to uh, have a personality disorder and, and stop working. So we get to re, uh, recant what we talked about yesterday, which is good, and I'm excited for that. And uh, yeah, so again, thanks for uh, being patient and coming back on. You know, a conversation so good, we decided to do it twice. Yeah, how about that? Like a fresh breath of air, <laughs> or or a cool breeze, or something. I don't, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> so, so that being said, man, before I go down a black hole here, let's. Uh, if you want to start off by giving us your superhero origin story and where you got started melting glass. Um. All right. Um. Well, uh, I guess started lamp working in two thousand and four. But um, the thought of it, the desire to do it, had been there since you know since I was a little kid. You know, uh, um, when I was six or seven years old or so in the mid to late eighties, and uh, you know we went down to Disney World a lot back then, and went to Epcot Center, and uh, you know wandering around Epcot Center, and as as a kid, Epcot Center sucks. Yeah, because it's it's all you know uh, things that want to teach you something, or you know they have all the all the cities that you can go to, but you can't drink when you're a kid. You know, so that's for your parents to enjoy. But yeah. we're working on Epcot Center, and um, uh, as you know, all this you know working at Disney, mm-hmm. um, and um, walking around Epcot Center, and we run into this this little glass studio where they're you know they were lamp working and making figurines and you know uh, horses and dogs and cats and dragons and unicorns and everything and um i just kind of being fascinated by it. you know it's, it's it's actually one of my earliest uh clearest memories um which is saying a lot because i don't remember like what i had for breakfast this morning but um i uh i remember just standing there like in awe just watching watching this this person just make these little figurines and it was so quick and it was so clean and they were so precise you know they you, you you knew exactly what they were. It wasn't a interpretation of something. It was it was an actual uh, uh, figurine. You know, it's you know it was it was that actual animal. And I was like, I'm gonna make a horse. And they get done making a horse, and you're like, oh, that's a fucking horse. And um, you know, so that was on my that was on my mind for a good portion of my life. And um, in high school, you know, I used to melt bottles and in bonfires at parties and. Then I uh, figured out kind of how to anneal them because, uh, you know, they would always crack. So I would dig pits next to the fire pits that we had you know, and fill it with coals and put all the bottles that I shaped and melted and everything in there. And then I'd cover it with sand and more coals and, and try to bring them down nice and slow. That way I could, you know, give these things to pretty girls. And, uh, then I got into stained glass later on, and you know the early 2000s when you could actually find stuff on the internet and look up stuff. I started looking into lamp working and um, spent some time looking into it, researching it, finding what I could online, any videos, any books that I could find, and then I bought uh, I bought a bunch of tools and glass and the torch and everything else and uh, got into a little bit found uh, found a guy on myspace uh, morgan schwartz from mystic glass in connecticut uh, went down and hung out for a weekend with him took a little class just to see what it was like um shortly thereafter i met this pretty girl um you know, threw a party at my house and she showed up and we get to talking, and I was like, huh, oh, that guy was cute. So I threw another huge party, like, the next weekend. He had to come back, and I made sure that I invited all the people that would invite her. And uh, she came over, and we started dating and dated for, you know, a couple of years on and off a thousand times. And we set up in her parents' basement and blew glass down there for a while. That's really where I, you know, took all those videos that I've been watching and and try those techniques, you know, um, Heck yeah. learn how to, hmm? Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, and, um, 
um, learned how to make marbles and pendants and, and everything else. And, you know, uh, then one of the thousand times that me and her split and I couldn't blow glass in my parents' basement for obvious reasons. Um, my, a couple of my friends were wanted to get on glass. So, uh, the three of us set up in my friend's grandmother's basement. Um, that was, um, myself, Charlie Reynolds and Ed Hauser. Uh, from past the glass here in Rhode Island, and we would take turns. You know, we had a uh, like a, a major minor burner. It was all beat up, and a box fan in the window, and you had to like slip your body in past this pole. And you know, it's like most people's first or second or third or fifteenth shops where you got to wear like seven layers in the winter, and you have like a kerosene heater like right behind you. That's like slowly burning your clothes and, and everything. And, uh, right. and, and in the summer you got all the doors open and it just moths just flying in, just committing suicide right in front of you and exploding. <laughs> Kamikazes. And, yeah. And, uh, um, we did that for a long time. You know, you know, when the three of us were there, we, we would take turns and you get up and you make a pendant and then you step off to the side and drink a beer and somebody else steps up and makes a pendant and, you know, you just go in that order. So, yeah. You don't really get like a rhythm going, but you still get to work and you still get to hang out with your friends. And um, but did that for a while, and then uh, um, and, and you know, it, in that time, I was selling glass to people and I was watching some people. You know, uh, used to buy glass from uh, PJ Davenport and watched him work a lot and got a lot of you know insight from him. Um, I. Uh, I shared a shop with uh, uh, Jesse Haskins from Scrow Glass for a while. Um, I set up in the basement of a head shop at one point um, just because I was selling to that shop and I was telling him that I was looking for a space to go and he's like, oh, set up in my basement. I set up in the basement and uh, I was vending at a festival one time and um, Melanie Kanzler was there uh, from Fire Dance Class, I think, is, is what she goes by. Um, and I had met her a couple times before, and she was blowing glass there. She was blowing glass with her friend Bobby, who was an apprentice of hers at one point. And uh, I met Bobby, and we just, like, immediately hit it off and, and became really, really good friends. So then I was going down to his shop every other weekend for quite a while, and, you know, he was the first person that showed me how to make pipe. Nice. You know, I had clusterfucked my way through making a couple of pipes. I remember that's that's what that's what I uh, when I get to that festival and my you know my friend who I was vending with she was like oh Jimmy she was like Melanie's here so they're blowing glass and I grabbed my case and went running over there way to show these shitty ass pipes that I made <laughs> and uh, you know it was like my my first chillum that you could you know you could like stick your entire fist in and uh, <laughs> like, look, 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 look what I made. You know, it's all like crooked and weird colors and it's bubbled out. And it's got a one pound and, uh, bowl in the front of it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, um, you know, so they looked at that stuff and, and I got talking to Bobby and you know, Bobby was like, Oh, Jimmy, you know, come to my shop. I'm, I'm, you know, not too far away in Connecticut. And it was a couple hours away, but, um, I started going out there and, you know, he was the first person that was like, all right, you know, this is how you make a spoon. This is how I make a pipe. And, you know, he, went through it and, you know, explained everything he did. And then he's like, okay, now you do it. And that he, like, was over my shoulder, like, you know, do this, don't do this, change your hand this way, you know, and um, walked me through that one. And then he just got back in the storage and just started cranking out production. And I just sat there and started thinking out what I had just seen or what, what I had just learned. And, you know, every once in a while he'd look over and be like, no, Jimmy, do this. Oh, no, Jimmy, do that. And, um, you know, that, that was one of the one of the more important uh, instances in my glass career was, you know, meeting him. Um, not only because it made me a, a much better glass blower, but he was also you know, one of the best friends I ever had in the world, you know, and such an influence on me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, and now it's to the point that, you know, we, we're constantly feeding off each other. You know, like, uh, he'll be doing something, I'll be like, Bobby, you know, how, how do you do that? Here, and he'll see something I'm doing, and be like, oh, Jimmy, how do I do this? And I'll show him something, and 
you know, through the years, we've just grown so much together by, you know, helping each other out and sharing everything with each other. Yeah, it's huge. Um, and, uh, uh, and then when I met my now ex-wife, I was living in a tent in the woods behind a friend's house and blowing glass every day because it was summer and I live in Rhode Island and you know, that's that's what you do. Yeah, hell yeah. So, uh, Sounds amazing. That's not what everybody does, but that's what I did. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's not what you do, that's what I do. Um, yeah, and, not, not, not uh, in or Florida. What you may do. What, what, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, then I was, you know, I was just doing that, having the time of my life, and um, I met this girl, and we were going to get married and have kids and all of that, and so I figured I should get a job with health insurance because I hadn't had health insurance in over 10 years, and I happened to find a scientific glass-blowing job on Craigslist in my, in my tiny little state. I took that job. Uh, I have since gotten divorced and not had any kids. Um, but I've still I've still been at that job for five years, um, you know, and I, I work four or five days a week uh, with Sean Conroy, who's a very very good friend of mine, uh, very very talented glass blower that you know used to make glass harmonicas and makes glass instruments now, uh, does a lot of casting, um, very very knowledgeable, uh, and he's had a, a gigantic influence on, on me as well. Um, just because of his overall knowledge and also, you know, he, he taught me how to be more precise because a lot of the things that we make at work, uh, the, the tolerance is very low. So, you know, if it says that it has to be, you know, uh, 130 millimeters long, plus or minus 0.25 millimeters, you know, if you're outside of that range, they might reject it. And you know, some things you can fake, some things you can't, some things you just wasted all that time on. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting talking about that too, because I, I had Mike Souza on the show, and he's a scientific glass artist up at Princeton University. And it was interesting to him talking about that, the tolerances, and like when, you know, like they now come to him saying, hey, we need this, this, and this. And he'll make a bubble and they'll do like pressure tests on them just to see like if they can handle the pressure that they have to put into these things to test whatever their gases are testing, you know, and it's, it's fascinating to have to find constantly fine tune your work and make it so precise down to like the micron, you know, like such as the smallest fucking measurement possible of pressure, you know, like you're saying, like you got to have these tolerances, especially because like a lot of the stuff's being used for like for NASA and for like all this major technology nowadays. And that's, um, that to me is one of the reasons why I've stayed at this job past when I probably could have left. You know, I don't necessarily need to work there anymore because I, you know, I'm not having kids and I don't have a wife anymore. Um, so I don't need health insurance for other people. Um, but the job itself is, is, well, it's fascinating. It's, it's difficult. And, you know, the, the harder something is to make, the more it intrigues me. Um, and even though a lot of times it's monotonous being there because I have to, you know, make 1200 of this tiny little electrode or something, it's still, it's still challenging. And that keeps me engaged. You know, it, it keeps me from, from, from getting bored because it is so difficult. And, you know, I, I like to say that a, an idle Jimmy is a dangerous thing. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm very bad at being bored. That's when yeah, you know, dumb shit happens. Yeah, so, me too. Um, and uh, you know, so I've been there for five years now, and that's that's been a a, a big part of, of of my journey as well. And um, you know, a couple of years ago, I uh, took all the the money I had in the world, and I uh, bought an old Bethlehem lathe, and so I could you know, do a production line of tubes. And you know, I started uh, my company, Mindful Glassworks. Um, and, you know, that was the beginning of me transitioning back to, to just working for myself at one point. And little by little, I'm, I'm getting there. You know, I've, I've been preaching baby steps to everybody for the last couple of years. You know, you don't have to change your entire life in one instance you don't have to just flip a light switch and now i'm different 
you know, if you, if you, if you want something, you know, there's, there's a path towards it, and, but there's, there's all these, you know, that path is made up of all these different steps, you know, and you don't need to take these long strides necessarily. Uh, you can just go a little bit at a time. So I identified the direction I wanted to go in and, you know, what the, what the next step was. And I took that step and then the next step and I took that step and, you know, uh, little by little, I've been getting back to the point where, where I, I can support myself just, you know, just making bongs and butt plugs and stuff like that. Um, and eventually I will go back to that. But at the moment, here I am. Yeah. You, do you, do you find too, like having the, the, the gig at the scientific place, it gives you a chance to really focus on your glass at home without stressing about it. And like, you know, like, kind of like we talked about yesterday, you know, about the whole not having ego in the shop and stressing out about your bills and shit and just being able to go there and focus. But the fact that you have this, you know, this, I don't want to call it a backup plan, but in a sense it is, you know, where you know that if you go in the studio and your day goes to shit and nothing comes out, you're not stressing because you know you got a paycheck coming in. Like, do you think that that is helping you in terms of fine tuning your, your personal work at home? I, I think so. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do rely on, on that to also help me pay my bills. Cause I, I didn't move out of, I mean, I still live in the same apartment I had when I was married. Um, I still drive the same car. You know, I, I pretty much doubled my expenses. Um, so I, I kind of rely on that money to, to help me out. Um, but having the, you know, 40, sometimes 40 plus hours, uh, a week, um, definitely, definitely takes the, the, some of the pressure off because I know that every two weeks, you know, my bank account's gonna, gonna have money deposited into it. And I know that, um, I mean, I've got paid vacation and I have my birthday off and, um, you know, and the health and dental and all that, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of stress off, mm -hmm. off you know, specifically, you know, when, when you're getting up, you know, to, uh, you know, our age, when, you kind of need that stuff. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I didn't have, I didn't have health insurance for over 10 years. And as soon as I got it, I needed a surgery. And, you know, and then a year after that, I needed another surgery. And like two months after that, I needed another surgery. And, um, if I didn't have health insurance, I would have been fucked. I yeah. Been fucked. Yeah. You know, but shit's not cheap. Yeah. That's why I want to do a whole talk about like the fact that you know as, as a small business owner and an artist it's in this industry alone it's easy to run a business it's like you know it's not easy to get started but you can get started and once you get started and you have a plan and a goal then it's easy to maintain it but like it's so important to have like a like a self-insurance like a self-employment pension and you know there's, there's different ways of going about being self-employed where you can have insurance and you can have your own retirement 401k set up for yourself because you know it's shit adds up, you know, even just putting 20 bucks a week away into a savings account, you know, like, you know, paying taxes, like there's all that shit that we talk about, you know, that is just so important that I don't think a lot of, a lot of folks think about that are living the day to the day to day mentality, you know, which I'm all about living in the moment, but like, which I used to not think about, the, you know, the future is like, Oh, I could just walk out today and get by a car. Fuck it. I'm gonna spend all my money today. You know, and then tomorrow I'm broke and I have no fucking money to feed my kids. It's fucking stupid, you know. And I, I did that shit for years. Or it was like the mentality of, oh, I'll just go make a pipe and go sell it. But then you hustle and try and sell the pipe and then you can't sell it. And then all of a sudden you have this glass piece that you can't eat for dinner, you know. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's all the shit you got to think about. Like, you just got to gotta make plans and prepare. And it's, it's again, as, as, as an artist or even just being young, it's not always easy to think that way when you're in your 20s. You know, you're going to live forever, you know, kind of kind of thing. Well, uh a big a big part of that is um, a lot of people get into this lifestyle at such a young age and they haven't learned really how to take care of themselves. You know, they don't teach that stuff in, in primary school anymore. You mm -hmm. know, you don't learn how to balance a checkbook or do your taxes or uh, uh, or a lot of people don't even know how to cook. You know, I, I, I have friends in their in their thirties who still can't cook. Um, you know, so a lot of people get into this and. You know, they they get caught up in the excitement of it. Mm -hmm. You know, they they you know they think, oh, I'm going to blow glass, and you know, everyone's going to think I'm the coolest thing ever, and you know, life's going to be perfect, and you know, I'm going to be a rock star for the rest of my life. And 
um, they, they never learned how to, how to budget. They never learned about finance. You know, they never learned about business and, mm -hmm. you know, e even, even when I wasn't putting things in, in a saving account or a 401k or, or buying stocks or anything, I used to, I used to have envelopes in a safe. You know, that's, that's how my, my father taught me how to, uh, you know, how to save and how, how to budget, you know, you'd have a, you'd have all these envelopes and um, on each envelope is something's written down, you know, like I had an envelope for concert tickets, I had an envelope for glass shop, I had an envelope for new glasses, I had a, uh, uh, an, an envelope for tires, you know, so every week you take a little bit of money and you put it in these envelopes and eventually, you know, you have an envelope full of the amount of money you're looking for, you know, you, you need you need to get put tires on your car. You go look in the envelope, and you got a couple hundred dollars in there, or, or even if you have forty dollars in there, you have forty dollars more than you thought you had. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you know, uh, luckily he he taught me that in my early twenties. So I I became good with money pretty early on, and um, you know, and and as we were talking about yesterday, you know, I got into business management at a very young age. So when I was 19 years old, you know, the uh, restaurant I was working for wanted to make me an assistant manager. And, um, you know, and I cleaned myself up a little bit. That way I could do that. And I've, you know, just been doing that pretty much ever since. You know, every time that I go back to work for somebody else, I, you know, end up running a business for somebody or helping to run a business for somebody. Because um, it's just naturally, that just makes sense to me. And, um, and in between all that stuff, I would, you know, take off and, you know, go live in the woods in Ohio or go, you know, live in uh, Arcata, California or just go on tour with some, you know, cute girl with dreadlocks and a, you know, and, and a tattoo on her face or something, you know, just whatever the hell, uh, whatever in interested me at the time or excited me at the time. Sometimes, you know, you, you see something shiny and you're like, ooh, that's shiny and you want to pick it up. You know, sometimes that would be uh, quitting my job and, it was giving away half my shit and getting in my car and driving across the country, yeah. you know, because there was a, a, a shiny new state to live in or, you know, some uh, shiny new lady to chase around the country. Or, um, you know, but then every time I would I would stop and settle somewhere, I'd end up, you know, managing somebody's business more. And uh, that has helped so much uh, with my glass career because – Right from the uh, right from the very beginning, as soon as I started to make anything with some consistency, I was able to to also see it as a business. Um, and yeah, you know, I I still I mean I, I I still love and still love the lifestyle of you know I'm going to stay up for two days straight and blow glass because I feel like it. And you know uh, if you need to take a random day off, you take a random day off and go do something fun. But I still I still have kind of a regiment, you know, I, I know the hours I need to work, I know the amount of products I need to make, I set a time frame for myself, I used to have, a, as we talked about yesterday, I used to have an Excel program that I, I, I uh, drew up that was a formula that when I get to the end of making a, a product, you know, I would tie myself when I was making it, and then once it came out of the kiln, I would weigh it, I'd plug in the weight, and I'd plug in my time, and it would do a calculation and tell me the very base that I need to get for that product to make the amount of money I wanted to make, mm -hmm. you know, to make the profit that I wanted to make. Um, and you know, that, that to me is, is, is so important. It's something that like not a, a lot of people you see in, in the industry, uh, understand at first or, or sometimes ever. Um, and you see a lot of people that, you know, uh, they're, they're starving artists, you know, they complain about having to work, you know, too much and not being able to pay their bills or they're always liquidating stuff at the end of the month so they can pay their rent. And um, this, this isn't always the case, but some of those people, at least, if, if they just understood uh, the business side of it a little better or focus more on the business side of it, they, they might not have that problem every month, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I I have a full time job now, but I used to just work for myself, and I made more money doing that than I do at the job that I have. 
now, um, even with the benefits and everything included. Um, I still made more money working for myself, and you know I set my own schedule, but I set that schedule. So I might not work Monday through fr- through Friday, but um, you know if I want to take a Tuesday off to go to the beach, I go to the beach. But then on Sunday, I'm going to work, and yeah, exactly. some days I work eight, hours, days I work twelve hours. You know whatever whatever need needs to be done. Um, but that's uh, that that's something that a lot of people don't really focus on. And like I said, I think it's because uh, a lot of us got into this so young before we, we really had to learn a lot of, before we had to learn how to, you know, uh, budget and before we had to learn how to do our taxes, file our taxes. Um, and then the next thing you know, you're, you know, you're, you're in your thirties and you got tattoos on your knuckles and, uh, and you, you know, you're still struggling to pay your rent every every month Mm -hmm. and you know luckily i can say that you know in my late 30s yeah i have tattoos on my hands but i pay my rent on time every month and i save money and i have a 401k and i own stock um i go on vacation um you know like i i I live comfortably and i'm not rich by any means by any means but um what i do have I live within those means, you know, I have a nice apartment. Um, I drive a cute little Kia. Um, I live with a cat. She has food all the time. Um, I go to, I go to concerts, you know, like I, I enjoy my life very much and, and I'm able to do that because of glass, you know, and, um, you know, 13, 14 years into it, um, I'm at a point where, where I can support myself, I can live comfortably, and I can do the things that I want, and um, a lot of that is because I was brought up with that business mindset, and I brought that into it from a very early, uh, early period, mm-hmm. rather than trying to get into it later on and try to figure out later on. Yeah, man, it's and it's cool that you that you still because you know it's a lot of times it's like you know it's the whole bring a horse to water, but you know you can't make him drink thing, and it's like we can talk about this shit till we're blue in the face, and you know I'm I would be curious to see what percentage of the audience would take action at this kind of stuff that isn't taking action because it's it's so easy just to start doing it, you know, but you got to have the tools because like myself, like I grew up in business, like like my grandparents were business owners, my dad was a musician and an artist and and was self-employed as a designer and stuff. He works for Lowe's as a kitchen designer now because he was just tired of fucking around with the industry. You know, he'd have customers come to his, his shop and then they would take his designs to Lowe's or Home Depot and have them done there, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. So he's like, if you can't beat them, join them kind of bullshit, you know, when he's at his, in his 60s. So I've been around it, but they never really showed me the business side of stuff until, and I had to learn that on my own. Like I, had, I went to Subway and worked at Subway for seven years, and you know, some I, I tell people that, and they look at me cross-eyed, like I'm fucking crazy. But it's like, you know, if I'm going to work for somebody, I'm taking complete full advantage of whatever knowledge I can get out of that situation, and I learned everything from how to do production. I mean, literally doing production, doing our prep work in the morning and cranking out a hundred sandwiches an hour at lunchtime kind of shit. It's no different than what we're doing in pipes and, and then learning the business side of it and learning how to manage my time. And you know, it's, it takes self-discipline and don't get me wrong, man. I mean, I know you're probably just like me. It's like, you know, now that we're older, self-discipline is a little easier to, to do, but it's, it's still a struggle. But you know, <laughs> like you're saying, you know, you want to go to the beach on Tuesday. Cool. But you know that you have to then work on your other day that you would have off instead because you got to sacrifice yeah. that day, you know, and stay ready regimented and stay scheduled and stay organized <clears throat> but it you know like my personality and the way I've always been it's and it and I which I'm breaking out of here now that I'm 40 but it's like I go buy a planner or a business book or some kind of scheduling tool and I'd get organized and then I would forget that I was fucking organized <laughs> you know <laughs> you know like people are like why well, don't clean my room because I know where all my shit's at you know it's like well fucking start cleaning your room and put everything in the same place every time then you'll know where your shit's at you know it's just it's just you just gotta fucking start doing it and I love that you brought up like the envelope system like that's you know like again my parents never taught me I mean my parents were divorced but individually they never taught me how to like do my checkbook or how to any of that kind of stuff and before I started doing this podcast I came across Dave Ramsey and Dave Ramsey's a big into 
understanding how to how to manage your money and simple forms and stuff. Like he has these baby steps that you go by, but he one of his things is the envelope system, and he talks about that all the time. How you know you get you get your money, you get a thousand dollars in, you know you need to break it all up into your material costs that it costs you to make that thousand dollars, your whole all your overhead first, but then. Just recently, I came across this this uh, show and book. It's called Profit First, and I'm actually in the middle of trying to bring the guy on uh, Mike Michalowicz onto the show. It's a great podcast, but their whole philosophy is all about paying yourself first. But he also has it set up to where you have like six or seven different accounts at different banks. You know, like you have two different banks you work with. You have one bank that has your primary checking account for your personal stuff. You have your business account there. You have two separate savings accounts for emergency funds or whatever. And then you have at another bank or an institution that you don't go to and you can't touch, you then have your money that is allocated there for your taxes and also for a savings account. That was where you put your profits at. And he says profit first because even if it's just 1% that you pay yourself at from right off the top of the deck, you at least you know you're putting 1% away to, to yourself. And his whole thing with his profits is every quarter, you then take your profits that you paid yourself and then you go have fun with it. You don't spend it on anything in the business, nothing. That little bit of money that you put aside is for you to do whatever the fuck you want to do with because you're already saving money for your rainy day fund. You already have your taxes saved up, like all that stuff. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's, there's there's like the gap principle where you take, you know, it's like the basic accounting principle where you take, okay, I made $500. I now know that it cost me 250 to make that. So I take the 250 out. I take 15% towards taxes. And then I have what's left over is my profit. But mm-hmm. to go with the profit first principle, it's... It, there he's helping accountants like change their mentality of how to go about doing this print this this accounting practice because like the gap principle has been around for a century or so that this country has based itself on you know and to get to the mentality because again like what we're doing as artists we're we're a, it's a lifestyle for us it's it's a it's a unique opportunity to live this lifestyle that we want to live and do what we want to do and travel the world and be artists and what have you but you got to have a set standard practice of your accounting and by going through whatever whatever it is just got you got to do something you can't just like make your money and be like oh let's go have some fucking fun tonight because i'm like you know like i think the worst place for these trade shows is in fucking vegas i get it because it's like the convention center of the world but you know you got some of these these guys and gals that have no self-control they'll go there and make 10 grand it costs them five thousand dollars to get there and set up and sell all their shit they sell all their glass that cost them five thousand dollars but they got 10 grand in their pocket but really that 10 grand just paid for their trip and for all their materials and then they go to the casinos or the strip clubs or whatever, and they go home with five bucks in their pocket, and they just realize that, wow, I just didn't, I didn't do anything. I just worked my ass off for six months just to come here and get fucked up and just blow my money on casinos. And not only did they blow all the money while they're there, but the time that they're there, they're not working. Yeah, exactly. So that's also more money that they're losing, and that's something that, um, you know, we we uh, talked a little bit yesterday about. Uh, I think we mentioned like like little things that people miss, and that's something that. A lot of people in in that situation might miss. They might say, "Oh, fuck, you know, I just this trip just cost me, you know, this much money." But something they might not take into account is the week that they've been gone, they could have been working, you know, eight to ten hours a day, um, you know, and they're also losing that much that that much money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, or, uh, yeah. Well, look, my drive like to to work. I have an hour and a half one way drive. Like I'm actually moving out there in September to cut back on that. But like. I I have to take three hours and add that to my time that I'm on on schedule, and then divide that by what I'm getting paid to get my real pay scale. You know, because I, yeah, you know, I have to. So hey, you want to hear one of my favorite sounds in the world? I love it. Did you hear that? I did. <laughs> the hell was it? It's a it's a can of cider. Oh, nice. <laughs> Hell yeah. Well, I guess it is 1230. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. It's, uh, uh, I get to stay off. Fuck it. Yeah, exactly. Um, what kind of cider is it? It is a down east cider. I think this is from Vermont, maybe, hmm. or something. I think. I don't know. Yeah, I love where like the whole craft drink industry is going right now. It's neat. Yeah, I don't drink... I don't drink that much anymore. I mean, I would probably have a drink a day, but uh, uh, when I do, I certainly enjoy them. 
Yeah, same here. Uh, you know, um, uh, I, I told you uh, an anecdote yesterday about a friend of mine who uh, you know, always has a, a lot of glass stock, and um, he'll get to a point where he liquidates it all because you know, he, you know, he might need money or he just wants it gone, and he'll sell it for you know, sell it for like three thousand dollars or something, and then in his eyes, he's like, I just, you know, I just had a three thousand dollars sale, but not taking into account that all the time and, and effort that went into making it, you know, his profit is probably very negligible. Because he just sold it for, you know, he just sold $5,000 worth of glass for $3,000 just to get rid of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then when you, when you bring that up, you know, somebody like that will say, well, I've got $3,000 in my pocket. Um, not taking into account that they didn't actually make that much profit, you know, and uh, the little incidental things that, that a lot of people miss um, when they're calculating, uh, you know, their, their expenses. You know, you sometimes you 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 miss little things. You know, the amount of time it takes to drive to get your oxygen if you have to do that. Or um, I've, I've talked to a ton of people over the years where you're they show you something, or or you're at their shop and you're hanging out and they're making something, and you know, you're talking about you know pricing and, and and things like that. And somebody will say, oh, you know, I make these. It takes me you know eight minutes to make one of these, or twenty minutes to make one of these, forty five minutes to make one of these. And a lot of times I've noticed that people like that, they're not taking into account, sometimes they're not even taking into account prep at all. You know, so if they're attaching, uh, attaching tubes together, you know, to, to make their blanks and, and everything, sometimes they don't take that time into it or they don't take in the time of uncreating all the glass and cleaning the glass and cutting the glass down, um, whether they're snapping it or, cut, or, or flame cutting it or cutting out a saw. Um, and they, they miss all that time. So they say, well, I get this much money for this product. But they're missing a lot of things that go into it. And you know, I, I think that's another thing that leads to people at the end of the month, you know, oh, I gotta yeah, you know, I gotta sell all this, I gotta sell half of the glass that I've collected from other artists because I need to pay my bills, or I've got a case of glass that I made and um, I, I can't wait for a couple of days to go talk to a shop. You know, I need to need to sell it all cheap right now. That way they can pay their bills. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's, there's all these, these tiny little things that, 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 that a lot of people miss and missing those things. It all adds up. You know, it's, uh, yeah. I have a friend who, who makes a good amount of money, but never has any money. And the thing that I pointed out to him, I was like, well, every time you pass by, a convenience store, you stop and get a pack of cigarettes, you get a bag of Doritos, you get a Coke and you get a scratch ticket, you know, and that happens multiple times a day. And then that person, you know, has a kid in the car and gets a kid a candy bar or gets a kid a toy or something. And, um, all that stuff adds up. So at the, uh, at the end of a month, you know, all those little stops add up and then you take that month and multiply that by 12 and over the course of a year, you're spending a, a lot of money on these tiny little things and you don't even take that into account when you're, when you're looking at your finances or, or budgeting. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, uh, uh, something I've, I've pointed out to, to a ton of people is you just look at, at, at food as an expense. And if you, if you only spend $10 a day on food, that's $300 a month. That's a huge expense. Mm-hmm. You know, that's twice what my car payment is right now. Um, I say more than twice what my car payment is. And, how many of us only spend ten dollars a day on food? You know, it's it's the it's the the tiny little things in, in life that you end up missing that end up being so detrimental and, and so important. Um, and you know, that's that's something that I think uh, I think a lot about still. But I, I spent a lot of time thinking about trying to identify all these little things, and you know, <clears throat> even if you have to make a list of them. You know, that way you can keep it fresh in your brain. You can pay more attention to them. Yeah, and exactly. Then those get out of, don't get out of control. Oh, sorry, it's delicious. Oh, you still there, man? I lost you for a second. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was taking a sip. Oh, you're good. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, man. But it's and it's so true. Something I've come across recently, uh, it's, you know, going back to Dave Ramsey's. He came up with his company developed this app called Every Dollar, and it's basically a budgeting app, and it's it's so simple to use. And I've been using it to like, and then, and they say it takes like ninety days to get yourself a really good, you know, to get used to your budget because things come up that you weren't expecting, etc. <laughs> But like, you know, I'm just as guilty as anybody else to hit the Starbucks once a day or every couple of days or whatever. And it's like I go through my coffee expenses sometimes and it's like I'll spend three or four hundred dollars in a month on fucking coffee. It's like I think I spend most of my money on beverages over anything, you know, it's, <laughs> and it's fucking stupid. It's like, OK, I'm it's it's. A lot of it is just routine because I'm a I'm a very routine kind of person just in general. And when my routine's thrown off, I just it throws my entire day off or week or whatever. I mean, it sucks. It's just a mental fuck I get. But you know, it's like I drive by Starbucks if I want a coffee, and I'm like, all right. And I have to say to myself out loud so I actually hear myself saying, "Keep fucking driving, asshole." And I just keep on driving, you know. <laughs> And then, and then it feels good. And I'm like, cool, I accomplished that. You know, it's like being a crackhead and you're like, I'm trying not to smoke crack anymore. And you drive by your crack dealer's house and it's like, okay, don't go buy any more crack, asshole. And I feel like that way about this kind of stuff. But it's just because it's just stupid routine bullshit, you know. And a lot of us get in those habits. Like you're saying, your buddy going into the convenience store and, you know, buying all those little knick knickknack things. And it's just, a lot of it's just routine and habit. And it's that death by a thousand cuts thing. And it's, you know, it's, it's amazing how fast that shit adds up and it cuts into your profits. You know, if you're, and that's why it's important. Again, we talked about separating your money. You know, if you're, if you're all your money's going into one account, you cannot keep track of how much of that money that you're pulling out of there is coming out of your business, you know, at all. And if, and if you have a business savings account, you know, you, you're going to be more apt to want to go jump into that thing and take money out of it. Like we were saying yesterday, you know, it's like you're you're in a space where you have the discipline to know that if you have $1,000 in the savings account and you need to go buy tickets for a concert, you cannot touch that $1,000 in that savings account because it is not it's not allocated for that. It's allocated for yeah. for if your fucking torch takes a shit, you know. And I and I hear like, you know, like listening uh not listening but Carl Termini hurt himself pretty bad doing jiu-jitsu or some martial arts stuff he was doing and it, it's it's a wake up call for a lot of people to see an artist like him who is a name in the industry and who's an amazing he's a killer guy in general human being wise and an awesome artist and seeing him struggling trying to go through to work you know if he could have potentially or anybody in that situation could have potentially saved up like a 90 day emergency fund then you could actually take that time off and heal and then get back to work full strength you know, it's just, and I, I hate to bring him up as a name, as but it's just an example that we, you know, a lot of us listening to, you know, know who he is, and you know, but, name but I, drop. I, what's that? Name drop. Yeah, exactly. Without you know, not trying to throw him on the bus, but he's an example because he's he he. What I brought, why I bring him up because he's very transparent with his life and he shares things about his struggles and. Mm -hmm. You know, he he always laughs about it. Like he'll post a piece of glass and he gets like ten thousand likes. Then he posts like some veggies he pulled out of his garden. He gets like ten. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> and I'm the one liking his veggies over his glass. You know, kind of thing. But that's just my personality. But you know, but it's it's but it's so important to talk about this kind of stuff. And it's it's something I haven't talked about in a while. And I want to continue to talk. You know, do some individual shows again on this kind of stuff because it's again it's so easy just to set up a simple budget. Now, a question for you too, just to kind of thinking about things I've talked about in the business sense. When you're when you're calculating, like you had your formula, you know, you weigh your piece out when it's done being made. Are you are you calculating any any things that were re, like removed, like a blowpipe or a, some glass scraps? So like, are you taking that into consideration? Yeah, I uh, I kind of added that into um, like I, I took an average based on the product. So say the first time I made a. Uh, well, not the first time I made a wrap and rig spoon, but say when I decided, okay, this is the shape and the size of the spoon that I'm going to make, then at the beginning I would take uh, all the all the raw glass and I would weigh it. So, you know, Sam, I, I take out a stick of of uh, you know, double amber purple or something like that. I would weigh that before I made the piece, and then when I was done, I would also weigh it so I know how much color went into it. Mm -hmm. I would weigh clear blank so I know how much went into that. Um, and then I would assume, you know, a, uh, you know, a couple of oh so many pieces of four mil or, or oh so many pieces of, of seven mil 
um, into into each piece, and I would, you know, weigh that and then take that into account, and then I came up with an average for each product. So when I would weigh the product when I was done, when I would come out of the count, then I had a list. I said, okay, this product on average cost me this much per gram or this much per ounce. So then I throw that on a scale and I, I plug that number into my Excel program um, and then plug my time in and it would spit out a number that told me, okay, this is what you need to get wholesale on them. And I prefer to do wholesale because then there's just way less to worry about. Yeah, exactly. I'd rather walk, you know, I'd rather walk into a store with, you know, a case just full of glass and have them take everything off my hands than, you know, try to sell them online or, or you know, I, I used to vend at a lot of shows and, um, and that, that's, I mean, it was a great time. And, you know, I still plan on vending here and there as life progresses, but that's a lifestyle that, it is it's it's hard on you to begin with and uh, especially as an artist you know if you're going to all these shows and fairs and concerts and festivals and everything and vending you know that takes up all your time so when do you have time to blow glass yeah exactly and so yeah. i'd rather just i'd rather just have you know uh, a handful of shops that i deal with or distributors that i deal with and um and I, and i also like I really like getting orders. You know, it's, it's, it's great to go sit in your shop and, and make a ton of something, make a hundred of those or 50 of those or 200 of those or a thousand of these, um, and then go out and, and try to sell them or, or do cold calling, trying to like find shops to take them. But it's great when you get to a point where shops will call you up or send you a, a text or an email or a Facebook message and say, Hey, I need a uh, hundred of these, or I need, you know, 12 of this inline tube and, you know, 12 of this, you know, tree perk and, um, you know, that, that's, that's what I prefer is when I just get these messages saying I need a dozen of these, two dozen of these, half a dozen of these, a hundred of these. And then that allows me to, to plan better. Then I can say, okay, well, how much time do I need to do that? It takes me this long to make this product. So that means, I would need oh so many days to make it. And then I can look at what my schedule is like for the next week or two and say, okay, these are the days that I can work. And then I know, you know, if it's, if it's a Tuesday night and I have to go work for, you know, four or five hours, I know that a couple of days in advance. And when I go to work that day, you know, I had my, my regular daytime job. I know that when I'm done, yeah, I have to drive to my shop and I have to work until, around this time um, to, to make oh so many of, of this product. Um, and if I didn't do that, if I didn't like plan that out, I mean, then I don't plan very far in advance, but if I didn't plan that out a little bit in advance, then, you know, sometimes you get to the end of that Tuesday, you work an eight hour shift and it's like, oh fuck, I don't want to do anything. Like mm -hmm. shit, am I supposed to look glass right now? You know, yeah, but exactly. if I know I have to do, beginning of the day no matter how that day turns out i still know i have to go do that and i'm going to get up and i'm going to go do it hell yeah and i i should use that to to excite myself you know as the day wears on and my job isn't you know uh, i'm not the type of person you know as we were talking about yesterday like i haven't i haven't had a bad day in years you know like i don't have i don't have bad days i don't really get angry upset um no matter what's going on in, in my life and, and specifically at work, you know, I, I show up and I do my job and you know, I do it to the best of my abilities. And that's really, that's really all I can do. So, um, but you know, you get to the, the end of a, of a long shift and you know, you're getting kind of tired. You're like, Oh man, I, I am looking forward to like, you know, going to do something else. But then I started thinking to myself, I was like, oh, man, I get to blow glass tonight. You know, like, I get to make this tonight. I get to work on my lathe tonight. And I fire myself up, and I get excited about it. And then I go to my shop, and, you know, I, you know, put on some Cindy Lauper and, you know, dance around and sing songs and blow glass and and, and have a good time. Um, you know, so it, 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 it keeps me excited about what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. And having awesome. that... Having that Having that plan allows me, as I said, to uh, uh, to 
know how long it takes me to make something, and I can give people a, a more specific deadline when I say, uh, when they say, oh, I need a dozen of these, and I look at them, I'm like, okay, let me think about that. I'm like, all right, well, I can bring them to you, you know, next Saturday. And I know that I can do that because I know what my schedule is like in between when I got the order and when I say that I can deliver it. I know I can work on this day for eight hours, this day for two hours, this day for four hours, um, and be able to get the, this order done. And then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm never like, I'm never struggling to get anything done. I'm never, you know, uh, although sometimes I do stay up all night blowing glass because I want to, you know, I've never, I, I haven't had to do that in, in quite a long time. Yeah, man, that's you know, amazing. When, it's an amazing feeling. Yeah. When, when, um, when somebody says, you know, when you tell somebody, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring this order to, to the store, you know, on Saturday and then you, you know, you flake out and you, you know, you, you don't blow glass one day because you, you know, you're hung over or you feel like sitting on the couch watching cartoons or you, you know, uh, uh, or a concert comes up and you decide to go do that. And then the day before you're supposed to deliver that, you know, you're up all night and you see, you see things like that sometimes on social media. Somebody will post that, you know, uh, uh, they're supposed to be somewhere. They're supposed to be at an appointment at like two o'clock and they're like waiting for the kiln to cool down. That way they can take things out of the kiln and, and make it to this appointment and, and sell this glass. And, uh, not only is that stressful to the artist, but it's also stressful to the glass. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people don't deal things properly because they're in such a rush all the time. Yeah, that's why I call the. I was trying to come up with the name for like the lightning round, and that's why I call it the crash and the killing round. Because I know we've all been guilty <laughs> of it, dude. <laughs> we certainly have. You know, but hey, man. That being said, I'm gonna hit stop real quick and save this part of the recording just because I'm almost at an hour right now, just in case. Uh -huh. <laughs> so. And and while while it's saving, I'm gonna go pee real quick and get a coffee refill, mm -hmm. and then I'll be like back in like a minute. Okay. All right. Give me one second. All right. You know, once I started, once I started uh, the microdosing like a few years ago, um, it it just completely changed the way that I am in in, in public. You know, now now I can I can joke I can joke around in, in a small talk situation and, and, and feel comfortable. Oh, huh, that's interesting. I know uh, Tim, I think it was Tim Ferriss. Uh, he has an awesome podcast, but he, I think it was his show. And he had these two doctors on and they were talking about microdosing and they're, they're doing it under supervision kind of, kind of set up, you know? And like they're mm -hmm. doing it with people uh, that have post-traumatic stress disorder and like all kind of crazy shit that it's, they're coming out of these sessions like you know, no longer having this stuff. I and mean, it might take like three or four sessions, but there was one in particular that did a study and I think it was like 30, 30 professionals that had an issue that they were trying to solve that they had to have at least tried to solve it 10 times to qualify for this thing. And then they brought them all into this room with, and they were, able, they brought them in to have them help them solve their problem by microdosing. And I don't even, it was like, like, I don't even know what the, the it was like tiny about, you know? And, uh, I think they said like 95% of like, it was like 27 of 30 were able to solve their, solve their calculations and, or whatever it was that their thing was. And like one, for instance, I'm, I know I can't remember, forget it, but there was a, I think a guy was an architect or an engineer, but he had this new complex he was building and he was trying, it was down in Miami and he was trying to figure out a way to make this specific looking like overhang kind of gimmick that people can walk under that would keep them from getting wet and he had to have a certain design to it. And he was they trying to figure out this specific bolt, I guess, down to like the, the nuances of what to use, not only for the function, but also for how it looked, the aesthetic value of it. And he was able to, in his micro dose, in his trip, visualize him actually like being in the space, looking up at the awning, seeing the bolt, everything. And then he was on paper writing everything down and drawing these pictures and shit, you know, like mm -hmm. crazy stuff. But it's, And it's amazing how... LSD, for whatever reason, it's able to trigger certain parts of our brain like that. Those parts that we don't I, use, you know, it's amazing. I think it helps to to break down like um, uh, like I was saying about how we're we're brought up to not admit um, not admit the way that we really are. You know, we're 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 brought up with all these like like walls and defense mechanisms, and um, I think what hallucinogens in general do is they to help you to forget about that, you know, the, it's the the ego loss that I think is is so important. Mm 
Uh, and that's something that, uh, you know, that to me completely changed my life was finding hallucinogens because, you know, uh, my father's influence on me my entire life was trying to be one of these Northeastern boys. You know, he wanted me to play sports, you know, because he played sports and he wanted me to, you know, play sports and love cars and, you know, uh, yeah, be the uh, manly see, man. <laughs> yeah. See girls as objects and everything. And I'm just none of those things, you know, like I, I'm, I'm good at sports, you know, cause I've always been spry and, and in pretty good shape, but I don't give a fuck about sports and I don't care about driving fast in a car. And, you know, most of my friends are either girls or gay men, you know, because I just get along with them better. So I'm not going to like see girls as objects like a lot of boys do. Mm -hmm. And, um, my entire life, you know, he was, uh, and he's a very good person, but he, you know, he's very, you know, early sixties greaser. So he was trying to bring me up to be that certain type of person, that certain, uh, um, archetype of a, of a man and and I, I'm just not that and finding hallucinogens allowed me to well it, it helped me realize that I don't need to be that you know and uh, it allowed me to come up with my own idea of, of what I'm supposed to be as a person and it led me to to being this yeah man that, that's fucking awesome I, I just before I forget are you okay that we're recording this or or not I just want to make sure yeah, okay. Okay, because I mean, it's some, it's some deep stuff. <laughs> so I just wanna, yeah, I think it's going to touch it, people, though. I think it's good shit. There's nothing um, I'm ever going to say that I'm not okay with people hearing. Cool. That's a that's a, uh, uh, a promise I made to myself at one point in my life was I'm, I'm, not, I'm not into secrets, and I'm not into... I mean, I, I want to share everything that, that happens in my life, everything that's that's on my mind, um, for better or for worse. You know, and all you can really hope for, in, in my opinion, in life is to find other people that feel the same way and um, listen to what you have to say and, and you can listen to what they have to say. Um, and that's that that's always been very important to me. It's, it's been very important to me to... Uh, once I, like, like I said, once I, I, I realized that I don't need to fit into that archetype of a typical boy, specifically a typical Northeastern boy, um, what I want to do is I want to talk about that. I want to share that with people. I want to express that because maybe I can, I can help other people realize that. Um, you know, there's a, uh, 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 there's a great... Uh, it's, it's like a, a documentary, I think you would call it. I believe it's called The, the Mask We Live In. Uh, I, I could have that uh, off a little bit, but that's, that's it's basically what it's called. And it's, it's pretty much about that, like the way that we raise um, boys in our society. You know, the, uh, you know when, uh, when, when parents, when, when fathers tell them, you know, like, boys don't cry and walk it off and you got to be tough and don't act like a girl and all this. Um, and I think that really damages young men, I, you know, I, I think saying those things to them and applying those things to them really, really fucks up their life. You know, when, uh, I mean, I, I still have very, very close friends that, you know, in their thirties and forties that would be, would be afraid to cry in front of somebody, uh, specifically, uh, another man, mm -hmm. you know, uh, somebody in your family dies and, and you're afraid to show that you're upset. You're afraid to, 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 to cry, to show that it hurts. And that's, it's such a horrible way to, to live, to not be able to express your emotions or feel your emotions or share your emotions. Um, and that's something luckily, uh, you know, like I said, it was kind of implied to me that I was supposed to be this, this certain way. And, you know, and, and maybe that works for some people, you know, but, it doesn't work for me. I'm a very emotional person and I want to feel my emotions. I want to share my emotions. Um, specifically, like I was saying yesterday, uh, there's, you know, negative emotions. I don't want to feel, I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be sad. I don't, you know, I don't want to be jealous. You know, I, I don't want to feel any of the, those emotions because they get in the way. Um, I want to feel as many positive feelings as I can. And I want to share them with people. Uh, I, I, 
if if I could, you know, if if my happiness was a physical thing that I could then take and dole out pieces of it to people, uh, I would, and that would that would be you know everything to me to be able to share that happiness with people. Oh yeah, that's amazing. Well, you're sharing it right now, man. It's good shit. You got <laughs> good, you know. It's uh, yeah, it's it's good to hear because we need more of this kind of talk. You know, like I'm all about talking about glass, dude. Like I love fucking glass. I mean, you're the same way. Like it's I'm gonna do it until my my dick falls off. You know, but you know, it's we're so much more than being the glasses and just part. Of, you know, that's that's what we do. It makes our money. It's our passion. But you know, we're more than that, and it's good to talk about that kind of shit. Like you're saying the sports thing. I you know I kind of. I always kind of laugh about that shit because, like, I, I'm I'm a sports fan myself, but like, when I'm at a sports game, I'm not talking about the game. I'm talking about life. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, and it's just how I'm the same way. I like to, I just like to talk about everything else, but then about what's going on around us at the time. You know, unless I'm watching a movie or something like that, I'll comment about it. But, but you know, that being said, it's it's still nice to just have a fucking real conversation about people like when someone's like hey how's your day going i'm not gonna be like well i got up this morning and took a shit and brushed my teeth like i'm not gonna get into full details but it's like <laughs> if i'm in a shit mood i'm gonna tell somebody but if i'm in a great mood i'm like dude i'm fucking awesome i don't like when i hear people say oh i'm good i'm like why are you, you know or people come to work that are guests of ours i'm like hey how's everybody doing they're like oh we're doing all right i'm like you're all right how you know? And I, and I give them shit for it. And I'm like, you guys should be fucking having a blast. It should be fantastic. And they're in, like in our store, covered in, wearing their ponchos because it's raining outside. You know, but it's like, dude, you're fucking Disney. Live it up. You're wet in yeah. the rain. It's fun. Enjoy it. Be a kid. You know, life is so is so fragile and it's so uh, it's so chaotic and so unknown. And I, I just. I don't understand how, how people can't enjoy that. You know, like, it could end at any second. Just enjoy the shit out of it. You know, like, uh, um, the, the way that I see any relationship in life, whether it's romantic, friendship, uh, professional, whatever, if you, if you find somebody in your life that, that makes you happy, spend time with her. You continue to enjoy that time that you're going to Hey man, I hate to, I hate Jimmy. I hate to cut you. You're breaking up a little bit, dude. I hate to cut you off. I don't know if you're in a weird place in the house. Oh. Uh, sometimes I do have weird surface here. Is uh, can you hear me now? Yep, much better. Okay. <laughs> I also don't have the uh, headset, like the earbuds, in because I left them at my studio and I'm at home right now. Oh, okay. Um, so that might have something to do with it as well. Um, yeah, like I. I I, I don't understand how, I mean, uh, personally, like I said, like, I don't want to feel negative emotions. I don't want to be angry. You know, like, I don't want to uh, uh, be anxious. You know, I, I I try very hard to not feel that way because it just gets, it gets in the way. It gets in the way of enjoying life as much as I can. And, um, you know, uh, uh, as I, I started talking about, Yesterday, I think it might actually have been shortly before uh, we realized that, that we weren't recording anything. Mm -hmm. um, I, I named my company my company Mindful Glassworks for a reason because mindfulness is something that I've been uh, exploring very deeply for you know, 15, 20 years or so, like trying to actually connect with that concept of seeing things the way they are, and it's not about seeing the good or the bad. It's about seeing things the, the, the way they are, um, you know. And sometimes it's um, it, it's, it's little things like uh, like y you were saying that you know you you, you spend a, a lot of money on beverages, you know. And every time you pass by something, you 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 know you pass by like a Starbucks or something, and you're like, oh my god, I want that, I want that, I want that. You know, to actually acknowledge that you are that way then it allows you to decide whether you need to, 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 to change that or not. Yeah, exactly. Or, um, you know, uh, um, one thing that I, that I notice about myself and, and a lot of other people are the same way. And I have since been able to, to change it about myself was, you know, the, the anger and frustration you feel when you're working with glass and in life in general, but you know, when things aren't going your way and you get, frustrated and you get angry and you throw what you're working on or you 
swear at when you're working on them. And that just, that stops you from, that stops the creative process, you know, because now you're, you're just thinking about how you fucked up and, you know, and now you're struggling to make something else quick or fix this thing that you fucked up. And um, besides the fact that that gets in the way of your own creative process and your own life, and that also drags your, your, your own mental and emotional state down, it also affects the people around you. So, you know, your, uh, your frequency, like if, if you have all these negative emotions that you're expressing and there's other people in your shop, that affects them as well. And that's not fair. You know, so when things aren't going your way and you're fucking and piece of shit and you're throwing things across the shop and you're, you know, uh, stalking around and you're sulking in the corner, you know, all the other people that are kind of look last in that shop, they're affected by that energy. Mm-hmm. And it's not fair to them because they just came to work with, with a positive outlook and a po- positive attitude and they want to get something done. You know, they want to create, they want to uh you know, they want to blow glass because that's that's their lifestyle as well. And you being in a bad mood and expressing it openly like that, you know, and and stomping your feet and you know and and, and stalking around, you know, that brings them down as well. And that's something that I said to myself that I I, I didn't want to do that. I I didn't want to be I didn't be that person again. I never wanted to be the person that that I would be. You know, in, in a bad mood, you know, and and affect the people around me. Mm-hmm. You know, I I'd rather just be happy all the time and and have that affect people. But you still allow yourself to feel the emotion of of negativity in a sense or sadness. I mean, I'm sure you're not just like you know fucking rainbows and unicorns all goddamn day. You know, I understand. You know, being what you're saying. I just want to make sure the audience understands that you're not just like saying that. You know. You're happy, 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 yeah, yeah, happy, yeah. you know, because yeah, you have your emotions and you're you're human. But I totally, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but your perspective and being mindful, it's it's you know like the ego, like we talked about yesterday, you know, putting the ego away. It's like it's so it's not easy to do, and putting your pride to the side and just being in the flow state with glass. Yeah, you, you you're still gonna feel, you know, th- those emotions are still going to creep into you. But I think the thing that was important for me was learning to. Learning to uh, to acknowledge them, learning to be mindful of them, and then moving on, mm-hmm. rather than, you know, like uh, some people they go to, um, you know, they might go to Starbucks down there up up here. They go to Dunkin' Donuts because there's like four of them on every street, and um, they go to Dunkin' Donuts and they order a, a French vanilla and they get a hazelnut and it ruins their fucking day. Like, yeah, it ruins exactly. Their entire day. And the rest of the day they're just like. Because they get the wrong fucking coffee. I was like, man, you got the wrong coffee. Get over it. Yeah. And yeah, you know those those negative emotions still exist in my life, but they're very fleeting. And the rainbows and unicorn thing is actually it's it's not too far off. Like I I I am pretty happy all the time now. I I wasn't, you know, but but I am now because. I learned to uh, uh, to see those negative emotions and not dwell on them. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, they happen. And, yeah, yeah they, they happen and I see them. And I think about why I feel that way. And then I think about, is there anything I can do about it right now? Or is there any reason why being upset about it for the, you know, the rest of the day is going to positively affect that in any way? And pretty much always the answer is no. Yeah. So... You know, I kind of just shrug my shoulders and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to push that to the back of my mind so it's still there and I'm still aware of this situation, but I'm going to enjoy everything else around me as much as I can until it's time to deal with that situation. Yeah, man. And, and I, I get what you're saying too, because like for my, myself personally, I'm like, I'm like, like by fault, I'm overly optimistic and I'm learning how to keep that optimism there but then bring a sense of realism into <laughs> into it to kind of mute it a little bit so that i'm not like oh this is going to come out perfect every fucking time or like i will do something and expect that in my head 
being positive about it that this is going to happen and then it doesn't happen because I wasn't being realistic about the situation to begin with. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, so I understand what you're saying. Cause like, you know, my, I guess my long term goal, you know, is enlightenment in a sense or whatever you want, you know, would want to call it. And you got to have that. You got to have that balance of the, of the saying like, like, you know, there, I hear it all the time. People getting pissed off. I'm in, like, I'm in, like I'm in Starbucks and some dude's got like a fucking 20 shot espresso and they, they didn't put enough water in it or something. And it like ruins this guy's entire week. I'm like, bro, you got a nice car outside. You got a house over your head. There's people right down the street that are living on the sidewalk and you're complaining about your fucking coffee. Like I, those are the kind of people I just wanted like punch in the face or just say something to him or something you know like dude are you fucking kidding me jesus i'm spending my last three dollars on this coffee what are you talking about <laughs> you know? yeah. which is a lot of times but you know but that being said it's like you know you just gotta you gotta it's i guess when you have an emotion it's what the like it matters what you do with it is and in terms of what the outcome of your mental space is you can live in it or you can say, what the fuck am I going to do about this right now? Nothing. And then you move the fuck on. And you, you know what? When, when it comes to, when it comes to that with a, a glass blower's lifestyle, um, I think part of that comes back to the, the business aspect of it. You know, if you're, if, if you put yourself in a situation where you don't have to stress all the time about getting that order done, uh, then you're, you, you allow yourself to, to not have those frustrated moments to, um, to, to not have those, those days where you need to get a, uh, an order done in the next like 25 minutes and, and you can't, and everything's going wrong. And then you get frustrated, yep. you know, because we're artists, you know, and to me, I mean, life, life, every, every aspect of life should, should be enjoyed no matter what you're doing. But as an artist, you know, like I do this because I love it. I do this because it's, it, it excites me. It, it's, it's fascinating. It's, you know, it, it's it's the thing that I think of all the time. It's 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 a way to express myself. And those times that I had when I would get frustrated with it, and you know, I'd I'd throw something on the floor that I was working on, or I'd say, oh, I can't blow glass today. You know, nothing's going right. You know, that's that's taking away from every precious second that I could have working with this medium. And that to me wasn't fair to me. Like I, I want to, I want to enjoy what I do. I want to, I love it so much that I want to love it all the time. So even when something goes wrong, you know, I, I think I, I was saying yesterday, when something goes wrong, rather than getting frustrated, you know, I look at it because rather than saying, Oh, what the fuck this thing, you know, because it's not the glasses fault, you know, you fucked up. Mm -hmm. If something broke, it's because you did something wrong. You know, you, you know, you're, you're, you tagged the inside of your seal or you didn't get something hot enough or you used the wrong color. You know, you encased a green or something and, and now it broke. It's not the glasses fault. It's your fault. So when something goes wrong, I just look at it and I say, oh, fuck. You know, all right, well, what did I do wrong? And then I identify what I do wrong and I approach it again uh, in, in, in keeping, keeping, trying to keep negative emotion out of it. Now I'm like, oh man, I'm a fuck up. You know, I look at him like, oh, what are you wrong? Oh shit, I tagged the inside of the seal. Okay, let me try it again and try not to do that. And then, you know, usually the next time it goes right. Yep. You know, but uh, when you get frustrated, those are the days where the entire day just goes to shit. Mm, exactly. Yeah, and sometimes you get those days and you got to learn just to walk away from it and then just get a refresh start the next day. Yeah, you know, an, an important thing that I tell people, um, people that I've that I've taught, um, I say when things aren't going your way, you need to reset. You need to reset your brain. You know, so you need to do something that completely takes you out of what you're doing. You know, so uh, that could be you know going and sitting down somewhere and eating a meal, or that could be taking a shit. You know, you mm -hmm. go do something like that that completely takes you out of what you're doing and brings you into a completely different place. And then when you come back, it's, it's like a complete reset, you know, it's like going back into it fresh. Um, and I, I always use the taking a shit, uh, example for people. And, and everyone always like giggles when I say it, I'm like, no, nah, seriously, we do that. And people have then told me like later on in life, they're like, dude, they're like, that actually works. I'm like, yeah, because you, you know, you go like, you know, 
sit down on the throne and close the door, you're in your own little world. And, you know, that's something new that you're doing. And then when you're done, now you go back to doing, you know, it's like, okay, now I got to do something else. You know, and you go back to blowing glass and it's, it's, it's like, like a fresh start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why I talk about like when you're working for yourself to stay disciplined and also to be like, to be pretty productive and be able to get on social media or whatever is to work in three hour blocks. Like I'll, I'll do like when I was doing my own glass full time, I would do like three to four, three hour blocks in a day. And that hour in between, I would go some, do something completely different. That wasn't, I'd go use, I'd go work out in the yard or I'd go take a nap or go for a bike ride, you know, something that was completely different or eat lunch or do my social media or respond to a message or email, you know what I mean? And it, it just made it, so where I can come back, even if I was halfway between a piece, if my alarm went off, I would stop what I was doing and go take my break, mm -hmm. and, and then come back and get that refresh start. And I'm and, and I'm something I'm doing right now with with the gig over at the Mouse House too, trying to stay on track, is with my whole new fitness diet. I'm doing this, uh, uh, fucking uh, the hell is it called? I'm having a complete brain fart. Anyways, oh, intermittent fasting where I'm eating in like an eight hour window throughout the day. So I have like, I'll eat my meals between like probably 11 to 12 and eight o'clock. But sometimes I push it up where I won't eat anything all day until like four o'clock. And then I'll have like 2000 calories in like a five hour window kind of thing. Um, That's what Terry Cruz does, correct? I don't know. Maybe. I think that's how I heard about it was like an article. I saw that, uh, that they're saying that Terry Cruz does that. Oh, interesting. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I I read about that, um, and I I've thought about it. It's it's actually kind of probably what I do uh, inadvertently. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just forget to eat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that's where I'm at, man. I guess I was kind of my point was like I get to a, I'm at a point now where like if I'm doing my day of, pr of production um, at work, I understand if my the piece I'm working on is not going well, it's probably because I need to go eat. I got to recharge and get and feed myself. So it's yeah. like, it's just finding, and it's be, again, it goes back to being mindful and understanding your body and paying attention. Cause when you start pushing through that stuff, if you're in the middle of a long session and you start realizing you're fucking up, it's time to turn your torch off and go walk away for a little bit. Cause either you're going to break your shit, you're going to burn yourself, fuck yourself up maybe more. So, it's, you know, you just got to stop and walk away, which again, is why I preach about the three hour blocks. I think three hour blocks are great because you get, you get a lot of shit done in three hours. It's amazing. You can watch a whole movie, blah, 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 and get a lot of shit done. It's um, you know, that, that that reminds me of uh, the way that I, uh, uh, the way that I do classes when I do classes. You know, like uh, um, you still see a lot of places that they do like an eight-hour class or eight-hour beginner class or uh, or something like that, and that's never made sense to me because specifically with beginners, um, if you have an eight-hour class, well, the stuff you learned in the first hour and a half, two hours, you're gonna forget by the seventh, eighth hour. Yeah. Um, so anytime I've done classes with people, I don't do more than two hours at a time. I say, you know what, come in for two hours and then I'll let you fuck around for an hour on the torch. That way, everything they learn in those two hours is fresh in their brain and they can just work on that on the torch. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's important to, in my mind anyway, to, to break, to break things up. Like you said, you know, like, um, to, to have these blocks because, uh, specifically, uh, uh, I think for, for people like us that, you know, struggle with ADD, um, if I sit down and, you know, I try to go just eight hours straight on something, you know, I'm going to get to a point where I'd, I probably get bored or, or I get frustrated or I lose my focus. And, uh, and that's when things start to go wrong. And that's when, you know, I'm not at my best. Yeah. You know, so, uh, I, I do the same thing at work. Like I make sure that I take my breaks, um, and I actually plan them at certain times of the day. That way, my day is broken up into certain blocks that get a little easier. And when I'm at work at my regular job, you know, I work until five o'clock. Well, I take my last break usually at four fifteen. I take my last fifteen minute break, so I come back from it at four thirty. Then I only have thirty minutes left. Mm -hmm. So after that break, I feel like. I feel like I'm already going home. Yeah, dude, you do the same thing I do at work. It's hilarious. I mean, literally, that's exact. I do the same fucking thing. I I take my last break. I'm off at nine o'clock. My last break's at eight o'clock, eight eight thirty, oh, yeah. and I come in, put my shit away, and go home. Yeah, because psychologically, it, it it helps a lot because yeah. 
you come back from that break, you're like, oh, fuck, all I got to do is clean up and go home. Yeah. The worst for me is if I get into something I'm working on and I get, because 4.30 is usually my first break, but if I get into like, like I think I did it on Saturday night. I uh, It was like 7 o'clock and I took my first break and I was like, and I also, I think I did it too because I had um, had a snack earlier in the day. So my, my energy level was good. And all of a sudden it's like, fuck, it's 7 o'clock. So I take my hour break and then I got to take my half an hour break still. So I guess I'm done working for the day. <laughs> you know and that's pretty much what happened so but it's it's cool like you're saying it's a definitely it's it, and, and not everybody does it this way but if you can just be mindful and understand how you work and pay attention to that shit keep a journal even if you have to write this stuff down and then just fucking do it and just try to try different things try experiment with yourself and just to see what works better for you and honest to god man staying hydrated through this whole process is probably the most important thing that you can do to in a mental space to keep yourself going Yeah, and um, uh, one thing I just thought of that I used to do when um, when I was strictly doing production and you know uh, uh, back when I used to put in like twelve hour days, um, just from a psychological standpoint, uh, I would start start off my my day every single day by making mushroom pendants for like an hour, you know, because that's something that's so easy to do. It's so quick. And at the end of that hour or two hours or whatever that you're making those, you look in the kiln and you have a pile of those things and you know that, oh, I just made this much money. Mm-hmm. You know, you wholesale them for, you know, four or five bucks a piece or whatever. And you look in and, and you got 20 of them in there and you're like, wow, it's like I've got like 100, you know, 100, 100 plus dollars sitting in the kiln right now. And that would always... It would always kind of jumpstart my day. You know, I would already feel like I accomplished something. And then I could go on to making everything else, you know, rather than... You, 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 you know, oh, today, today I'm making double bubblers, and you, you go to make double bubblers, and the first one goes wrong, and you're like, fuck! You know, and you have to throw that one across the room because now you just wasted all that time, and you yeah. go to make another one. And, you know, if you mess up the first couple of things, you, you can't expect to be making, you know... Uh, more complicated pieces, you know, like, well, today I'm making inline bubblers, you know, well, the first inline bubble goes to shit, you just spend like an hour, two hours or something on it, well, well, now you have nothing to show. Whereas if you go in and you make something very simple, very quick, and you load up a pile of those in your kiln, every time you open up that kiln, you look at it, you're like, oh, shit, look at that. I already have all this in the kiln. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, man, actually, when I first started this podcast, I was trying to think of things to do as a group, as the audience, and I was like trying to think of challenges and stuff. So the first, the first, I think it was July, was like the second month of the show, I did a 30-day pendant challenge. And the whole idea was if you make a pendant every single day for the, an entire year, even if you sell them for 20 bucks a piece, you know, you do 365 times 20. I mean, it's like, you know, you make, a, make a bunch of money. But if you could sell them for 50 bucks a piece and you and you maybe say you do it for 90% of the year, it's a great way to start off your day and you can make an extra $5,000, $10,000 a year just making these pendants yeah. every day, starting off your day. It's a, you know, take, take 30 minutes, take an hour, you know, like you see salt, for instance, like he's, when he started doing his pendant auctions, he's been doing a pendant auction like every day for three years and he's making a shit ton of money on whether it's a collaboration. But a lot of times they're like, like their practice pieces. Uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff smart goes by Jay smart. He does amazing character work. And a lot of times, like when I talk to him a couple of times, um, the way he practices his stuff is he makes a pendant first. He'll make, if he's trying to figure out a character look of it, he makes a, the head into a pendant and then he auctions that mm-hmm. off and he has exclusive with a distributor that carries his actual functional work. But he, then he auctions off those pendants. So it gives these collectors a chance not only to buy something that's a, and so, you know, quote unquote affordable, but it also gives him a chance to practice his piece. He's getting warmed up. He's getting his mind set. He's got his colors. Like there's a lot of going on there. Like I, I used to pull, like I did my production to start off my day. I'd pull points for like the first hour. I knew I could pull like 50 points and that was like the rest of my day of, of my rap and rakes, whatever I was making. But it was also because I would sit down, like we talked about, you know, revisiting the whole baseline calculations. I knew the formulatic, you know, equation to figure out what this piece was going to take to make it, you know. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I can go all over the place with this warming up your day with warming <laughs> up because it's so it's so important. I mean, fuck! Imagine how many studios around this country have piles and piles and piles and piles of like three to four inch sections of eight mil laying around that they've never taken mm-hmm. the time to piece it back together. That's a great way to start your day. Go back and go through all your shorts and recycle everything. 
Yeah, yeah. that's something that um, when whenever I would uh, take on a student, that'd be one of the first things that you know because I always focused on on the basics. You know, yeah. like a lot of people they they want to get into it, they want to take a class, they want to learn how to make a rig like the first day, and that's something that I'll I'll never do. You know, like I'm going to teach you why glass does what it does, mm-hmm. how to make it do what you want it to, and, and um, so, so things like that. Like I would teach people, okay, well, you know, your first day you're going to pull apart a seven mil and then put it back together, and um, you know, doing it by hand, doing it on a on a marver, um, and because uh, that's, that's the, those fundamentals are so important, and there's been a, you know a handful of people at least maybe half a dozen to a dozen people that, you know, like, uh, I help them get their, get their feet wet. And then, you know, two, three years into it, they put a, a post on Facebook, you know, thanking all these people that helped me get into class and my name is never on it. And then two, three years after that, they put another post up thanking like people that helped them get to where they are. And I'm always on it. You know, Cause then they realize later on, they're like, Oh, the, the fundamentals that you taught me is like, what really helped and what really made me, me like that base made me what i am mm-hmm. it's like you know what it's like i'm not no uh, i've used the analogy before uh, when it comes to teaching in general not just glass but you know uh you you could go to a guitar teacher and you could say i want to learn these three songs and i'm going to teach you the chords you you need to play those songs i'm going to teach you how to play those songs does that mean you can play guitar no it means you can play those songs but if you go to a guitar teacher and say, I want to learn how to play guitar, and they, they sit you down and they teach you the three, why the guitar does what it does and how to figure out those songs and, you know, the, the, the key that it's in or the mode that's in, you know, they'll, they'll actually teach you how to play guitar. You know, yeah. I would rather teach, I'd rather teach somebody how to blow glass than teach them how to make something out of glass. Yeah, exactly. And it's, 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 I'm glad you bring that up because I have this online course I'm launching here and I've, I'm in beta test right now. And the the first the, the first class I'm doing for the betas are for those that have some glass experience. But it's a creators and creatures class and it's six weeks. It's a six week class and each uh, animal that you make each week, it's a it's a progressive process of learning the medium to get you to the final step. And we're starting off with a manatee on the first week and a manatee is a real simple shape. You have some attachments for the arms, and you have a little bit of detail on the face. So it's you know it teaches you the medium. You learn what's going on, and then the next week we're going to do is going to be a dolphin. It's kind of a similar shape, but not so fat. But then you add you got fins to add to it, and then I'm going to break down. Okay, this is the technique on how you make a fin on a piece of rod. You know, like I can't tell you how many times when I was learning how to do these dolphin tails on my own, I was just making like, I took a rod of like 10 mil or 12 mil and would go along with whatever glass I needed. Cause I didn't even, I wasn't even shown how to do it. I had to figure out what's, what's the proper diameter rod to get this amount of mass to make this look of this fin I'm going for, you know what I mean? So I had to experiment with that. And then once I, I mean, it literally has taken me like probably a year of experimenting and fine tuning to where now I could bang a dolphin out in like 10 minutes or less. And it looks like a fucking dolphin. Like I'm, you know, not to kind of humble brag here, but like the, it's only because <laughs> I have done it a thousand fucking dude. Learning how to make these dolphin tails for me personally was probably the most frustrating thing I've experienced in glass blowing in the last fifteen years. Like it was because I know a dolphin tail has a specific look to it. You know, it's different from a whale tail. It's different from a fish. It's different from a shark. You know, dolphins have very specific tails. So learning and understanding how to do it. And I was, I had someone show me how to like, how to do the process, but that was it. It was just, I would sit and watch them make these dolphin tails and I had to like make mental notes and then. And and learning how to do that, I imagine was probably also a very important step for you, uh, uh, in, in, in glass blowing because learning, uh, just figuring that out would, would make you a better glass blower, taking the time to figure that out. And also, in the process of, like you said, learning how much mass you need, mm-hmm. that helps you in in other aspects when you, uh, same thing when you're making a um, a different figurine or you're making a a, a can for a bubble or something like that, yeah. knowing the amount you use. Yeah, because that similar technique, like that's why I preach about pulling points, but like the making that fin, 
I was then able to make bird wings where now I can make dragon wings. The dragon wings taking me two years to figure out how to make a fucking a realistic looking dragon <laughs> wing. But I got it down now. I got it down to a science. But I can also now teach it from the bare bones minimum process of, okay, this is the technique that you practice with. These are the scales that you're doing going back to the guitar. It's the same fucking thing. You got to practice your scales. Just like you got to practice mm-hmm. pulling points. I think pulling points is the number one most important foundational technique that any glass blower can do whether you're pulling a point and rod or a tubing it's still stretching out a stringer or pulling a center that's perfectly round evenly that wall thickness blowpipe and the way that i mm-hmm. teach like when you remove it's like you know you pull your point the the process i teach to remove the point off the tubing to start off your next point or whatever you want to call it is the same technique you do when you do a color wrap, like a, you know, or a body wrap with some color. It's the same process, just wrapping a little bit of glass around the edge of where your mouthpiece on the blowpipe is going to be. And then you can knock that off or stick it in a thing of water and it pops right off. But that process of spinning that color around the mouthpiece is the same fucking technique you do when you're wrapping and raking color. So it's mm-hmm. like, it's like all these things. And if you sit every day and you pull 50 points from when you start off blowing glass as an, as a newbie, it's amazing how much you're going to understand the medium because it's like you're saying, I'm not going to teach you how to make anything from the very beginning. I have, I mean, literally, I probably have a hundred pounds of scraps of all my little shorts that I keep. And I keep those because I not only recycle them myself, but I use those for teaching. You know, I teach you separate them out. What size is what I make you go with a marker and write down there and then you piece them together and then you build those out and make them longer to understand what it means to be on center. You know, it's Mm -hmm. like all that shit, like, Everything builds up one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. If you just want to just jump in and start making rigs, God bless you, but I'm not going to teach you. <laughs> this, part, this part of our conversation just reminded me of uh, the Karate Kid. with like wax on, wax yeah, off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it doesn't seem like like in that movie, he's like, oh, what the fuck? I'm just waxing the car. Oh, what the fuck? I'm just paying a, a fence. And then later on, he realizes that that's the foundation that taught him everything and that's the foundation of everything else that he knows yeah exactly yeah it's well said it's a good analogy it's so true and i love it man and that's why i love this medium because it's like you know like we talked about yesterday in terms of like uh, kind of my mental space where i am now at 40 compared to where i was at 22 23 when i started blowing glass to where i am now pretty proficient at what i do you know i'm not a master by any means but you know, I'm making things that look like a realistic animal, not just representational. And that, that, that takes a lot of practice. But, dude, it's the, the maturation process of understanding where our ego was then to where we are now and to where now, like, something fucks up. It's like, okay, what did I do wrong? Instead of, like I was telling you yesterday, like, I literally caught my backyard on fire because I threw a hot piece of fucking glass out there because I was so pissed. You know, yeah. it's like, I wouldn't do that anymore. I know that it's not only dangerous, but it's just a waste of my energy. I only got so much energy to give. I'm not going to give that broken piece of glass everything I got, you know? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, and, and like you said, now now you're making realistic uh, um, th- things that actually look like, like what, you're, what you're making. And, you know, that's um, like I was saying about my, my my very beginning, my very origin is when I saw the people at Disney, like yourself, making these figurines that looked like what they're supposed to be. Like they're making a dolphin, they get done, and that's a fucking dolphin. Mm-hmm. Like that, such an impact. I mean, the fact that the fact that somebody could take glass and make something like that, it it just it boggled my mind at such a young age. And I said, oh, like, holy fuck! Like this is what I want to do. Yeah. This is I want to do that because. It's, it's incredible, you know, um, and it's, you know, and, 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 you know, uh, going back to the, you know, not getting frustrated part of it, you know, like as, as we mature and, uh, and we can learn from our mistakes rather than getting upset on ourselves for our mistakes, you know, it, it, it allows us to be able to do things like that. It allows us to get to the point where we can, you know, make dolphins that look like dolphins, make manatees that look like manatees, make dragons that look like dragons maybe <laughs> yeah dude absolutely and and i think and we, you know and, it, and understanding the medium it's it's so important just to know the medium because there's such a difference between hollow and solid like you know if i want to make a realistic dolphin and mm-hmm. that's hand that's actually blown glass that shit is difficult <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so but i'm but it's understanding the medium you know it's freaking awesome yeah uh, a, a friend of mine um uh, my friend bobby who i brought up a, a, a few times he, you know, we were talking about different glass and, um, 
you know, uh, people say, oh, I hate shot because it, because it, it doesn't fume well, or, you know, I, I only use Cymax because it fumes this way, or US-33 doesn't fume this way. And something he said to me, um, and I'm paraphrasing like a conversation that me and him had, all of those different glasses, especially when, specifically when it comes to fuming, they all fume a different way. So if you're using shot thinking that it's going to fume like Cymax, well, it's not. But shot has its own way of fuming that can be very appealing. So pretty much what we came to in our conversation and what he imparted to me was, you know, uh, like, like I said earlier about when something breaks and you yell, so understanding medium, you know, you can take any of those different glasses and, and get a, a great result out of them. You know, and if you learn how, uh, you know, if you learn how shot fumes and what it likes and what uh, uh, flame chemistry it likes and what metals it likes and what concentrations it likes, you can get some amazing fume work out of shot. Uh, uh, and same thing with Cymax and, 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 and everything else, you know, like uh, even, even, you know, clear from China, which I don't ever use. But if I used it, you know, there's probably a way that that fumes that other things don't fume. You know, learning the medium and learning what, you know, the, the chemistry of, of these, these different types of glass, you know, that just allows you to become a better artist. It, it allows you to be able to accomplish more without feeling limitations, without saying, well, I can't use this because it doesn't do this. Okay, well, what does it do? Yeah, exactly. You know, it might not do us, uh, but what does it do and how can you use that? Yeah, well said. Yeah, and again, dude, you that's know, just like, that's uh, just mentality too, man. It's just the way you t way you think and talk, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like if I do something, someone's like, "Why'd you do that?" And I'm, my answer is always like, "Why the fuck not?" Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, why the fuck not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I didn't mean to cut you off either. Uh, no, no, I was probably done with what I was saying. I think. Okay. Well, I, I tend to ramble. Hey, man, me too. So it's all good. <laughs> but but before I uh, we go on too long, I I gotta get into my which is the reason I contacted you. So I, I, I found you on Instagram because of your character that you do, your other personality, your alter ego, uh, Jimmy the Don. And when I first saw, I first saw your first post of it, I literally had to watch it probably twenty times and tagged a bunch of friends in it and had to show my daughter. Even like it's just it's just classic to me it's it's what i love about social media is having the ability to just show different sides of who you are like i'm all about showing off my glass and shit but i'm also about like you know this is my family this is what i do blah 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 and here is me being just completely fucking goofy or whatever and you're consistent with it which i think is killer so yeah man so let's talk about jimmy the dawn so i like to know his origins and like where that whole thing started because Again, I, and like I told you before we started recording, I haven't asked you this yet because I want to hear it fresh along with everybody else because <laughs> it's just such an interesting, unique thing that you do. And you guys got to check him out. So his Instagram is at Mindful Glass. I'll have a link in the in the show notes. And yeah, so let's get into Jimmy, the Don. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, well, the the name itself is actually goes back past the the videos. Um, it's a nickname that stuck with me for a long time because I used to throw these big parties and I happened to look like the guitarist from Fish. So everybody like in uh, that, you know, uh, in this group of people in Rhode Island all like knew who I was because I looked like him and I threw these big parties. So I got this name, Jimmy the Don. Uh, my friend called me, uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was Eddie Hauser from Passive Glass Studios. He called me Jimmy the Don of all hippies. And that name stuck with me. And then the way that the videos came about was I was talking to a friend of mine one night and, you know, she was, uh, you know, something was on her mind and I was trying to cheer her up. So I, I just made a couple of funny videos and sent it to her and she thought they were great. And I, I, I showed them to, uh, um, this girl, Sarah, one of my best friends, you know, cause I thought she liked me. She was like, you need to do more of those. I showed them to a few people and everyone's like, you need to do more of these. So I started doing these videos trying to, trying to make people laugh, trying to spread joy, trying to show people that life doesn't need to be so, so serious, you know? And, uh, um, 
somehow they just, you know, <laughs> they, they just became a thing that, you know, uh, I, I, I do, I do tend to wear a lot of fur because it's, it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I do drink a lot of mimosas because they're fantastic. Um, and you know, my, my friend Sarah, she does these, these, uh, she does these videos on Instagram called Life Hacks. It's like, this is Life Hacks with Sarah. And uh, she nice. saw these videos and she was like, she's like, oh my God, I have my Life Hacks and you have your Pimp Snacks. I was like, oh man, that's like the perfect name. So I have that hashtag Pimp Snacks. Nice. And uh, I originally thought about like having, once once I was doing more of them, I thought of having a separate Instagram, but I want to do that like because it's all it's all part of me. Like you said, like it's a way to show different sides of yourself. Mm -hmm. So I, I left it all on one on Instagram and, um, you know, I was doing them every Sunday for a while. Recently I've been kind of busy, so they've been kind of spotty, but I'm just about to go back to doing them at least every Sunday. And it's to, it's to show people that, that life's funny, man. Like life's fucking hysterical. I laugh all the goddamn time because it's, it's fun. I enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. When when I, you know, when I make these videos, I I I try to plan them out, and it never works. I'm always like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna buy a, you know, a baby watermelon, and I'm gonna buy, you know, like I have all these thoughts in my head of all this like weird shit that I can do, and I never end up getting any of the stuff that I need, and I just make it up with what I have around, right before I do it. So, you know, I uh, I I got into hollowing out different foods. Yeah. <laughs> Because uh, uh, I think the first one was because I, I kept on having this this carrot in my sleeve that um, you know, my friend Adam I, I did it once and uh, uh, my friend Adam uh, another one of my you know, very best friends he he said he's like that needs to be your signature move yeah dude oh my God, great idea. <laughs> I know I brought that up before we start recording the, the carrot in the sleeve thing is fucking hilarious I laugh every time I see it I'm like and I'm expecting it too so don't 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 don't, don't stop that <laughs> and. and- and that's that's how the original like hollowed out thing I think came around because I realized that I had done it enough times for it to be expected. Mm-hmm. So then I took a cucumber and I hollowed out a cucumber and put a carrot inside of it. So then you know at the end of the next video when I go to pull this carrot out of my sleeve, it's a cucumber, you know, and I look at it all confused and then I crack it open and there's a carrot inside. <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> People, people saw that, and then I got all these messages, you know, the uh, the next day, and they're like, "Oh my god, that's the best one you've done." And then, you know, and I started hollowing out more things, like hollowed out a, a, an apple and put pickle slices in it. Yeah, that was the first one I saw, and I, then when you did that, and dude, I was, it, I like it because it's it's complete two different things that you're just not expecting to go together. I wasn't expecting for you to pull the apple in half, also. So like the way you're doing it, it's it's well done. Like the the production value is great. Thanks. Um, yeah, you know, like I. Um, like I said, these, these things just kind of happen in, in my brain. Like as I sit down, I'm like, oh, it's time to do a pimp snacks. And um, I you know, just kind of sit down and just whatever happens in my head happens. But it's, you know, like I, um, I want to spread joy. I want to make people laugh. I want to make people happy. I want to make people see that you can be silly. You know, you can be weird. You can be odd. And, and it's completely okay. It's It's... It's, it's what makes life enjoyable. And the fact that the fact that I'm making these videos and sharing them with people and, and it, 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 it makes people laugh. The fact that, you know, that's why you reached out to me. The fact that people send me messages like saying how funny it was and how, how much they look forward to them. Like that, it means so much to me because that means that, you know, maybe I'm, I'm putting a smile on somebody's face. Maybe... You know, if if just one person in my life, you know, if just one person has has uh, you know, who, who who sees the things that I do, you know, maybe it's having a bad day, and then they see something like that and it cheers up their day. Mm-hmm. You know, that is is worth everything. You know, because the life is life is beautiful. Life is gorgeous. It's funny. It's it's fun. It's whimsical. And you know, if I can share my you know, uh, my journey with people and, and, and maybe, you know, uh, maybe lighten up somebody's day, you know, that, that means the world to me. 
Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And it's what I think is cool too, man, is it just goes along with the whole like you're not identifying yourself as being just a glass blower. You're not a glass artist. You're just you're Jimmy and you this is all the sides of you and it's you know, it's it's easy to just get stuck in this moniker of I'm a glass blower, I'm a glass blower, look at me. You know, it's like, okay, what are you going to do with this this ability to live this lifestyle you could live and then who are you going to then influence out there while you're doing it? You know, so it's yeah. I've I've barely been put glass on my Instagram recently because I make all the same shit all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I think is cool with your Instagram too. I, I, like you don't really have a whole lot of glass on there at all. Yeah, because I, you know, like I'm, like you said, like uh, there's so much more to me than that. You know, like there's glass on there, but recently I haven't been blowing a lot of glass because I've been very busy. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm getting back into, you know, like this weekend I was blowing glass with, you know. Uh, a, a, a couple of very important people, you know, Bobby and, and Melissa. And, uh, you know, like, because I've been blowing a, a lot of glass recently, I don't need to put up the things that I'm making, you know, but I'm still, I'm still me, you know, I'm, I'm still Jimmy. I'm at times I'm Jimmy the Don, uh, you know, um, I'm a weird dude. I'm, uh, there's a lot of shit that happens in my brain that makes me giggle. And I want to share that with people. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, um, the hashtag that I that I use for some things, like uh, I think a couple of years ago, and I forgot about it until recently. I've been using it for everything recently. Is smiles tickle? You know, because nice. <laughs> to, to me, like that's 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 like my, in, my entire thesis of life is is to like smile and laugh and have fun and, and enjoy it. And I hope that the way that I uh, I hope that the things that I share through my Instagram and through social media have that effect on people. I hope that people see it and they just laugh. I hope they laugh and it brightens up their day. They put a smile on their face and whatever is happening in their life, you know, it, it, it just brightens it up. I hope that, you know, it, it, it affects people in a positive way because that to me is the most important thing. You know, I want to, I want to, like I said, like I, I want to share my happiness. If it was a physical thing that I could slice up, like you know, American cheese, I would make everybody a grilled cheese sandwich with Man, you... rosemary and bacon. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, just kind of a side note here: um, you should make Jimmy the Don T-shirts, just like a like a high glossy, sparkly like oval image of you on a t-shirt dude and that like with your in your seat with the curtain behind you like your little thing hanging up and then hashtag pimp snacks <laughs> i can go across the back in between the shoulders then i have like your little you know your little instagram on there or whatever that could be that could be your way of like, do it man i feel like sparkles that's what i'm saying bro like have it all shiny and sparkly and shit you know like some kind of foil gloss kind of thing but then you could uh that could be your way of of uh, people getting a, a physical piece of happiness because then other people will see that shirt and have a smile on their face too. <laughs> That's a good idea. They'll kind of be like, what the fuck is that guy doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's Jimmy the Don? I got to look that motherfucker up. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Well, I think right now is a good chance uh, for us to take a quick break and thank our sponsors. And then we'll come back and we'll be uh, time for us to crash the kiln. I can dig it. This segment of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Right now, The Flow Magazine is extending their deadline for submissions for their marble and paperweight issue, summer 2019. Uh, They have extended their deadline until March 30th, 2019. And if you'd like to have any kind of marbles or paperweights submitted, you have to have this in by March 30th. Make sure you please include an email with three to five high-resolution digital images of all your glass art that you have at least 300 DPI images. And along with a completed submission form to theflow.maureen at gmail.com, Check the show notes for the link for that. And again, that is for anybody interested in submitting any glass, marbles, or paperweights into the summer 2019 issue. If you also would like to subscribe to The Flow Magazine, you can go to theflowmagazine.com and use promo code WISEGUY, that's W-Y-Z-G-U-I, and you'll receive 10% off your annual subscription. That's theflowmagazine.com.
So let's get crashing the killing here. And the crashing the killing round consists of seven questions. Uh, they're short and quick. And if you want to give me a 30 to 60 second answer, and you can also expound upon them, which everybody always does. And the first question I always like to ask is if there is any living glass artist that you haven't worked with yet and you want to, who is it and why? Um, that's such a loaded question. Um, yes. I'll start by saying uh, Kim Thomas. She goes by Z. I think on Instagram she's Irox Z because the things that she's doing, they're just morbid and creepy and delicious. And that really appeals to me because I collect dolls and weird shit like that. Um, also like, uh, like, uh, uh, Colton, I really like his style a lot. He's been a big influence in me. Um, lace face because the way that she just, her overall vision of a piece, like it's a composition, uh, Emily Marie, because her, her shaping and her color specifically, the, uh, chromatech or chrom chromatic or however she pronounces mm -hmm. it like that new new line is just is very appealing you know i love colors and i love like those tight shapes so i would say all those people hell yeah that's a nice <laughs> nice list hey i'm gonna try and get all those folks on this show for sure they're on my list i made a long list the other day good. of guests i want to bring them on i'm like god i gotta bring all these people on here in like the next five years because <laughs> like when i first started the show i wanted to do like like one interview a week and then i was like well you know that's only 52 weeks and there's like 500 artists right now that i want to bring on that's like 10 years so how the fuck am i gonna do this <laughs> so yeah i gotta get more interviews under, under and recorded do like two a week and then we'll be good because now you we have get cracking man there's like 20,000 plus glass blowers now in this country alone it's fucking crazy not to mention that's like my pimp. I was going to do one pimp snack a week, but now there's so many things I want to snack on. I need to do more pimp snacks a week. Yeah, exactly. Like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday or something. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, number two question is, what are your top five favorite colors in glass? Top five favorite colors. I would say uh, transparent green, ice blue, or maybe it's glacier blue. I can't remember exactly what it's called because I like the way that they... If you reduce them, they get those those red halos. Um, I like clear. <laughs> yes, it's a color. Um, uh, I would say uh, periwinkle and maybe chartreuse. Cool. Uh, what's your worst injury in the studio? Haven't really had that many. Um, I've never been the type to pass my hand through a flame or anything. I mean, I've had some... Uh, pretty deep cuts on my fingers right when I would get to somebody's house to blow glass for like a weekend. Mm. So those have been pretty bad, but, but other than that, I've never really had a really bad injury. Cool. That's good. Knock on wood here. Yeah. Uh, when you're in the studio, do you watch TV, listen to music or do you both? Uh, music. I listen to music and I sing at the top of my fucking lungs, sometimes really off key. Um, as loud as I can and as, you know, uh, as weird as I can, it's all about music. And, you know, I love the fact that a lot of times when I'm blowing glass, I'm screaming Madonna at the top of my lungs. And <laughs> Hell yeah. People, like people that like out, outside of the studio are probably listening. Like, what the fuck is going on in there? The fun is what's going on. There. Yeah, exactly. Lots of fun. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Let's see. I'm trying to think of my questions here. I used to have them written down in front of me, and I, now I don't. So uh, let's see. We got the person. We got the colors, injuries, music. Oh, yeah. Do you have any uh, glass blowing theme tattoos? I do. I have uh, um, on the inside of my wrists, I have the Italian word vetro, and I have the Irish word goinia, and both of them mean glass. Interesting. They're just like a symbol. Um, well, I, I got the, like, I, I picked a certain font that I thought looked good in both words, and I had a, a friend of mine put them on there, and, you know, uh, I'm very Irish, so Gloinia, you know, like that, that made sense to me, and though I'm not Italian, a lot of our techniques, um, and a lot of the the base of, of lamp working and, and glass blowing comes from Italy, mm -hmm. you know, like a lot of it developed in Italy, so, and the company that I work for is also Italian, so like a lot of the glass we have at work, the the product names for the uh, uh, inventory, 
like an inventory is it's a vetro one a vetro ten or something like that so uh, that also means a lot to me so i get those two uh words tattooed on my wrists because nice. they're right because i use my hands for blowing glass they're right there all the time hell yeah that's awesome uh, if you could describe the sound of glass cracking in one word or a sentence, whichever, uh, what is it? One word or a sentence. Yeah, I guess I need to rephrase that. So how would you describe the sound of glass cracking? <laughs> uh, the sound of glass cracking, I'd probably say, oops. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's probably about it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the last question is, what are your top five favorite tools that are uh, beside your glasses and your torch? Um, my lungs and my mind, my hands. Um, if we're going to talk about actual physical tools, I would say um, I have those uh, tweezer jacks, which are really nice. Um, bail biters for uh, making bales on top of pendants. I use those for all types of shit all the goddamn time. Um, I don't use those because I've always thought they were a cheat tool, and it's so. I don't believe in cheat. I, I know that's the thing. It's a stupid way to think, because <laughs> I would save myself so much hassle. People people say that about like rollers too. They're like, oh, that's cheating. It's like there's no such thing as cheating. You're whatever you use to make your art. It's your art. So because somebody else doesn't use that tool, it doesn't mean that you're cheating. It means that you, that's how you're creating art. Yeah, so, exactly. Bale fitters work for me. Um, my lathe is uh, my, my lathe is probably my my number one tool. Um, and you know, I got an old beat up Bethlehem that you know it's it's not the straightest thing ever, but I can use it and I can make a lot of great things on it, and it means a lot to me. And you know that and uh, those bale biters, my my tweezer jacks, um, diamond shears. You know, all, all those things, they, you, you, you figure out the way to use these things. And as you go throughout your career, you learn how to use them in, in different ways. You know, the bale biters were originally just to make bales and pendants mm -hmm. because I made a lot of pendants. Well, now I use them for all types of crazy shit all the time when you need to grab something with more precision than you would get with like, like, like a tweezer or with like a piece of formula or something. You can take these bail biters and just bite right into it and, you know, grab it and pull it in one direction or the other. Yeah, that's a good idea. And, uh, that's, that's very true. Yeah, I, I, I use those a lot. I use uh, shears a lot, um, you know, for, for cutting a lot of stuff, you know. I love um, cutting glass, and that's such a weird thing, but I love cutting it. Yeah, yeah. When uh, when I first started, I just had a pair of scissors. and uh, Yeah, me too. And it was so so cool to just use those scissors to just cut through glass and you know now even my shears are still like shitty shears but um but they work and you know that that's something that i i i, uh, I would say shears would definitely be pretty high on my list because I, I i do a lot of um work with with a uh, uh, decro glass and specifically like flat uh, uh i make a lot of flat things out of, of decro glass so i end up cutting the cutting the basic shapes using my shears and a lot of times I finish it out on, on a wet saw, but, uh, having those shears definitely gets me close to the shape or heck yeah. Yeah. It's a good idea. I got to get a pair. <laughs> I got a couple tools I bought years ago that were like new to the market and were on sale. And I was like, Oh, that looks interesting that I have never used. Cause I'm not really sure what it's could, could be used for. And I pulled those out <laughs> recently because I'm like, I got to use these for something. Like these were like $75. This It's like I have like this weird, uh, it's like an isosceles triangle shaped uh, graphite piece that I thought would be used for like flaring out a foot or opening up like a wine glass or something like that. It's some kind of marmor mm -hmm. tool or something. I don't know. But I'm looking at it now more of a, like a like a carving tool almost for doing shapes and stuff. So I got to play with it some more. But dude, I'll tell you, my, yeah. my, my butter knife and my, and my spoon are like my two favorite tools. That have like multiple uses for all kinds nice. of things. Uh, maybe not a steak knife. No, I've got a butter yeah. knife that came, um, came out of the restaurant that I use over Mexico. <laughs> you see it, you see it in the restaurant. And you're like, ooh. Well, it was one of those oh, days okay. where I didn't, I didn't have, I forgot my knife, and I was like, shit. And so I asked Patty, 
who is our uh, main lady there at my store. And she's like, I'll be right back. And she went to the restaurant and brought back two different types of knives. And I was like, I will use that one. And now this knife's made like a thousand Olaf's and all these owls and everything else I've done on stage. And I use it. <laughs> it's perfect, man. It's like, the, it's got a nice balance, you know. But my spoon, too, is like a newer tool that I use for a lot of different covering cut and shaping and things. It's fun. Yeah, that's uh, something I'm just getting back into you know like i used to do a lot of sculptural work a lot of uh um it's a lot of sculptures and i used to do a lot of marbles that's really like the things that got me into class because mm-hmm. i i you know uh as, as i'm sure you may have done when you were a kid we used to play marbles yep like that was an actual game yeah and uh uh and i grew up doing that i grew up playing jacks you know like, oh yeah uh, hell yeah like most of my you know a lot of my friends are, are six, seven years younger than me, if not more. And they have no idea what the fuck that shit even means. Mm -hmm. And um, at one point, I used to make a ton of marbles, and I used to make these snails all called Mortimer. And uh, I used to sell a lot of these snails, a lot of these Mortimers. I used to sell a lot of marbles. And I even made uh, a handful of sets that were, were, uh, you know, I'd make glass jacks and and like a, a marble that looked like a bouncy ball, you know. And I would sell that set, and... I used to sell this shit for a lot of money, and then in 2007 ish, when the when the uh, market crashed, you know, it it took the wind right out of those sales because, you know, uh, November used to be a huge month for me, going to craft fairs and and holiday shows and everything, and and selling a lot of pendants and marbles and everything else that people would give for gifts. You know, I used to make thousands and thousands of dollars in November just going to these these fairs. And, and shows, and then uh, in 2007, I think it was um, in November, I made 152 dollars. Wow! And it it fucking crushed me, you know. And and it gets to the point where I used to be at like a concert or something, and I'd have all I'd have my glass out uh, on a case, and you know, just standing out out front of the venue, and people would come up and you know they'd look at my marbles and be like, "Oh my god, this marble is fucking sick as fuck! Oh my god, this changed my life and all this shit." And you know, people used to pay a lot of money for these marbles, you know, and then they get to a point where people would come up and be like, oh, my God, this marble is amazing. Oh, my God, it's blowing my fucking mind. I just shit myself. And then they'd say, you know, how much is this marble? And I say, oh, it's like 160 bucks, $200, $300, whatever. And they say, oh, I'll give you 30 bucks. Yeah. It's like, no, you won't. <laughs> no, you won't do that at all. Um, because people... At that time, they weren't spending money on things like that. They weren't buying art because they wanted to pay their fucking bills. Yep. And 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 uh, that is really what got me into just making pipes because it's it's kind of recession proof. You know, people always want those, just like people always want alcohol. And uh, now that the economy has been turning around and people are starting to spend money on art again, you know, I'm I'm getting more into sculpting and getting you know uh, um starting to think more about uh, what I used to make, you know, making marbles and making sculptures. And, you know, so now I have some knives and some random shit that I use for sculpting stuff. And, uh, you know, hopefully I can get good at that again, you know, specifically because that's what a lot of people are doing. You know, a lot of people are, are sculpting things and it's amazing. And I look at these things and I'm like, oh my God, that's what I want to make. Yeah, man, the whole it's it's amazing to see where the functional scene's gone from. I mean, it's it's evolved so much, but the amount of sculpt, I made just amazing sculpture work, and then you have the amazing collaborative sculptural work that's going down. You know, it's just it's just I, I love where I love where the industry's going, and you know, it's there's some areas about it that I don't care for necessarily, but it's like anything else, it's, you know, ups and downs and goods and bads and whatever. But it's it's still cool to see where things are going you know and the fact that you know everything we covered today and talked about is so easy to attain if you just make a plan and stick to it and and understand also that when you make a plan sometimes you got to pivot sometimes like you're saying you know you realize that that november that you took a shit and didn't make any money and potentially could have been like lost everything if you didn't have a plan to save some money and have a backup for that you know one thing about making a plan, or, or, you know, um, in general, in, in life, I don't really believe in, in picking a destination. You know, like so many people, they were brought up to think that there's a destination. That destination is a, you know, white picket fence, and 
you know, two point three kids and three boys with a cat and half of a dog, you know, right. and that's what life's supposed to be. And um, when you pick a destination like that, when you say, okay, this is where I want to get in my life. The problem with doing that is that in the meantime, in between achieving that and where you are at the time that you decide that, your mind can change, your heart can change, your outlook can change. Mm-hmm. So instead of picking a destination, I like to pick a direction. I like to say, this is the direction I want to go in. And that allows me to, to take different paths. It allows me to zigzag. And you know, if along that time I decide that, hey, you know, I'm go- so going on this direction, but now I want to head this direction. You know, that allows me to change without thinking that I'm failing. Mm-hmm. You know, if I just said, hey, I want to be this in the glass world. I want to be this person. And I want everyone to see this and buy this. And this is what I want to make. And this is how much money I want to make. If I, if I picked all those things very specifically, you know, now I'm putting a lot of stress on myself to, to achieve those things. And in the meantime, I might become a completely fucking different person. You know, like uh, just, just in the last you know, three years or so, my life has changed so much, you know, and what I thought I wanted five years ago, it's still in that direction, but it's not, it's not precisely what I thought I wanted. I had an idea in my head, well, this is where I need to be. You know, like I thought that by this age or or within a couple of years, I'd be living out in the woods again. You know, I'd still be married. I'd have some kids. I would sit at home and make bombs and, and butt plugs all day. And take care of the kids and my wife would be you know like a nurse or something mm-hmm. and you know like that's what i wanted and now here i am i'm divorced i do not have kids um i still make bongs and butt plugs and i live in the city <laughs> you know? <laughs> Com- completely different you know uh, uh uh place that i ended up in that time frame yeah Yes, it, you're completely right, man. Because like when I started doing glass, I mean, I, I didn't know what the, all I knew is I just wanted to make a bunch of money and pay my bills, and then I was stressing all the time. But like, yeah, I never imagined it in a million years. And I tell guests this all the time when they ask me about you know how I got to where I'm at, and it's like, I don't know, I just had childhood dreams, and now they're come true. <laughs> it's just kind of it's all surreal the path to get here, but the the journey, bro, has been like you've said before, like I don't regret a damn thing I've done. Like I sure there's things I could have done differently, but it wouldn't make me who I am today. And that where I'm at today, if it wasn't for those decisions that I made at those points in time, you know, it's just, it's just how we, we can't live with regrets and you could, and you also can't just save, 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 save. And then one day I'm going to retire and then go live my life. It's like, live your fucking life now, save now for that retirement, but also save now for, doing the things you want to do to go travel, to go, whatever, go, go teach classes in Europe. You know, this glass world's expanding, you know, take advantage of it. You know, like I said, uh, um, you only live once, might as well die young. Well, you know, like enjoy your life while it's happening, mm-hmm. but you still need to be mindful of the future. So I live, my life is fucking insane. You know, like I, there's, my friend said last night, you know, he was, you know, uh, uh, this cat that was me, you know, like he was petting her and he's like, oh, Jimmy, this, this, she has glitter on her. And I'm like, uh-huh, like that's how we do. You know, like I, every day of my life, I want to like laugh and play with colorful, shiny things. But I'm still aware of how long I can sustain that. You know, I treat myself physically very well. I exercise that way i can dance and blow glass and have sex at a high level for a very long time because i love all of those things mm-hmm. and i want to you know I, I i want to enjoy this life for as much as possible but just in case just in case i can because life is so chaotic and so fragile and uh and and so unknown i want to enjoy every second that i have just in case something happens because you, you never know you're like uh, uh i have friends you know, pass away all the time, you know, randomly and, 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 you know, uh, surprisingly, you know, and you never know when that's going to happen. So I don't want to be the person laying in a bed at 80 years old, looking back and thinking of the things I wanted to do. I want to be the person looking back and like with a big smile on my face, like, Oh fuck. Yeah, I did that. You know? And, if, if I'm laying in a bed and I'm talking to friends and family as I croak and I'm talking about things that happened in my life, I want it to be 
you know, I want, uh, I, I want it to be glorious. I want it to be jovial. I, I want, you know, everyone to, to be laughing and these, these, you know, big guffaws from all these, these things I'm talking about as I, you know, uh, recount the, the things that I've done in my life. You know, when I think about the things I, I do in my life, I want to smile about them, you know, and, uh, like you said, you, you, you shouldn't regret anything, you know, even the bad times in your life, they're showing you what's good in your life. So you just still enjoy those times. Like when something bad happens, there's always something on the other side and there's always something positive that's going to happen on the other side. It's always going to lead to something. It's going to teach you something. So rather than dwelling on it and be like, oh, fuck, I can't believe this happened, you know, like learn something from it and let your life become better because of it. Yeah, man. Well said. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah. And I was going to, to uh, ask for some parting piece of advice, but man, you just laid it down, drop the mic and walk off stage. <laughs> 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 yeah man that's awesome and i love listening to this shit and this is why i love doing the show not only for myself as a, in a selfish sense but also just because this kind of shit needs to be talked about and it's talked about in other areas and other spaces of the world and business and whatever but i think our the core of, of our, the community we're surrounded in glass we're not getting outside the glass world so it's fun to hear that this kind of talk is going on inside our community because it's so fucking important to have this type of talks. Like we need to have like round table discussions or have like panels at these trade shows that we're talking about this kind of stuff, you know, or, or doing like our version of our Ted talks, quote unquote, you know, for the glass scene. It's cause it's, it would, it would speak to so many people on so many levels about what the fuck life is about. And everybody's life has a different story, you know, and, and isn't about the same thing, but in terms of like the foundation of our lives and, how to reach that point of who we want to be and where we want to go. It's just, if we all keep talking about it, man, and keep doing it, doing it, not just talking about it, but doing it, it's going to influence generations to come. I'm excited to see where this, where this industry is going to go because of it. And that's the only, oh, you're, as an industry and as, yeah. as a species, we can, we can evolve. You know, if we continue to talk about these things and, and experience these things and live this way. Yeah. So, uh, uh, just like you, I'm very excited to see where this industry goes, uh, because it's been growing so quickly and it's been changing so quickly and it's, it's exciting. It's very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Brother. Well, again, man, it's, uh, I could sit here and talk to you for three days and I'm sure we'll have many more conversations from here, but, uh, uh-huh. before I, when I, I'll say, our, we'll say our goodbyes on the air, but hang on afterwards. We'll say goodbye off the air here too. Uh-huh. But, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I definitely am glad we got to do this part two and got to get this going. This is a nice long chat, and I think everybody will enjoy everything we talked about. We went all the fucking place, which is good. Because <laughs> so, <laughs> I definitely I definitely dig it, and I definitely respect your perspective and appreciate you taking your time out again to come back on, man. So thanks again. My pleasure. Hell yeah. So hope you all enjoyed this episode with Mr. Jimmy the Down. Guys, gotta go check out his Instagram. It's fucking hilarious, and uh, you can see his mohawk and everything else he's got going on in his life, including his cat covered in glitter. And uh, yeah, until then, and don't forget you can check out the show episode, or and don't forget you can check out the show at wiseguymedia.com forward slash one six five. Until next time, we will talk to you on the next episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. Take it easy. Peace. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Since its inception, the focus of The Flow has been to provide a bond among members of the lamp working community. In every issue, you can enjoy great content with the hottest artists and cutting edge techniques using the latest industry products. These features, along with the continuation of our Women in Glass edition, Glass Craft Immersion Artist Awards, inspiring gallery showcases, dynamic general interest articles, as well as health and safety information, make The Flow the leading international lamp working journal. For more information or to subscribe to The Flow, go to theflowmagazine.com. That's theflowmagazine.com.